Israel is a test of wills. Israel is very determined to completely eradicate Hamas. It's going to cause years and years of strategic problems. People are going to seek revenge on them. If I was an enemy of this country, I would do everything I could to fuel the fires of division within this nation. Do you think that China's doing that with TikTok? Yes. Why do you think so many people want you to run for president? <laughs> I would say probably if anyone wants me to run for president, it's probably because they look at the current choices and think just about anything would be better. So that's that's probably has something to do with it. I will say that you are a strong man with strong character. And if I had to guess that that's what people are going for. Um, I know you don't want to run for office, but <laughs> Does that resonate? Do, can you see why people would gravitate towards that at this moment? You are correct that I do not want to run for office. I definitely don't want to be in in politics. I I have friends that are in politics. It looks absolutely horrible. Their lives look terrible. It does not look like the kind of the the way I would want to spend my time. Because of how people go after them or something else? The whole nine yards. I, I mean, just having to travel to live in D.C. a bunch of the year. There's pragmatic, selfish reasons mm. that I look at it and think, but yeah, do I want to go and do that? And, and the, the answer that I usually give is if things got bad enough in the country, then uh, clearly I, I love America. And if that was required, then I would step up and, and do something. And then people, of course, say to me, well, how much worse can it get? And I usually say, listen, it can get a lot worse. Mm -hmm. it, things can get a lot worse. Everyone right now has a phone and they have food and we're, we're, we're doing pretty well comparatively to countries that f fall apart. So would I do it? at some juncture, if things got bad enough, yes. Would I do it if I was maybe older and didn't ha still have, you know, kids? I, I got one daughter left in in high school, so it's I wasn't around much for my other kids because I was deployed all the time, so it's mm -hmm. nice to be around a little bit more. And, uh, yeah, and I think that I would say that actually probably the reason that people might look at me and think, hey, he might not be a bad at that job is because I'm pretty level-headed, I would think. I don't fly off the handle. I can open my ears and my eyes and, and take in a bunch of different perspectives and understand people's perspectives and why someone might be saying one thing and why someone might be saying something else and how they're both probably got some points that make sense. And so I've spent, I spent the, my entire adult life really in leadership positions. So I've constantly been collecting data points and making decisions and driving things forward. And, and I think that probably is visible to someone on the, that, that looks at me. So that might be why they're thinking that. And I, I apologize for letting them down, but <laughs> I, I really don't want to do that, that yeah. kind of job. I can get that. I certainly not that a single person has ever said I should run for office, but I likewise would not want that role. But the thing that makes that question interesting is I've heard your answer about not wanting to do it, though we will get to the warlord part uh, at some point today. But the I think it says something really interesting about what either people covet in a leader full stop or what they covet in a leader right now. Um, OK, so you laid out sort of why you think people might be responding to you. But let me ask who would be the ideal person you would like to see in real life? Like who ideally would you like to see run for president? I think right now what we need is, is someone that's a, less polarizing and has a more open mind and is more concerned about or looking more to find solutions and compromise and figure out how to make things work rather than, hey, here's what the party that put me in this position wants to have happen and therefore that's what I'm going to do my best to make happen because what that results in is oftentimes nothing happening. So if we can't come to a compromise and figure out how to move forward, we don't make any decisions, we don't make any progress. So I, I would like to see someone that said, oh yeah, there's some good aspects to this idea, there's some good aspects to this opposing ideas. What can we do to take those ideas and pull the best components from them and 
put together an, an idea that's new that will function correctly. And, and look, you could say, uh, there's some saying, oh, if you're in the middle of the road, you're going to get run over, right? There's a saying like that. But look, that's the, the reality of life is there's, there's, different, there's different beliefs, there's different ideas, and, and everyone that has an idea, there's going to be some good components to that idea, and there's going to be some things that won't really work out. And in a leadership position, you've got to say, okay, what will, what will actually function? How can we move forward? And how can we make compromises that, that will benefit everybody? That all feels like the right gravitational center. But if you had to pick somebody, uh, like, so what prompted this question was somebody came up to you at the Arnold Classic wearing a shirt, I think, that said Rogan Haynes. <laughs> and you were like, something affirmative. I'm here for that or, you know, whatever. Um, maybe in jest or maybe serious. But of the people that you know that have that ability to bring people together, that have an ability to think through a problem and look for solutions and not get caught up in the drama, to not become beholden to their base, which I think is part of what people love about Rogan, is that he is, um, he'll have whatever he thinks to be true, he's gonna tell you. And whether that gets him in hot water or not, he does not seem to care. Um, I'm certainly not feeding you that as the answer, but mm -hmm. I'm just curious if there's somebody that you know in your life or a public figure that you're like, Literally that person. Yeah, I mean, Rogan's a good example of someone that has an open mind and he listens to different people's perspectives and he also changes his mind. He changes his perspective. When he gets new data in, he says, oh yeah, I was wrong about this subject and you can, he'll, he'll openly say, oh, this is what I thought before. Now I've learned this. Here's what I'm thinking now. And even when he says he's thinking something now, he doesn't say, this is what's correct now. He says, no, this is what I'm thinking now. So having that kind of an open mind, that's the kind of person that, I think would do a good job in that position. I, I can just about guarantee you that Joe Rogan does not want to be president of the United States of America. But yes, someone with an open mind like that, that's gonna, that's gonna bring in new information and, and put those data points into the calculus of a decision-making process, that's, that's what I think someone would be good in that position. I don't know if there's any public figures that I can think of off the top of my head that, that sort of come to mind. I mean, uh, I'm friends with Tulsi Gabbard. I think she's a very squared away woman with a, a, an open mind and she brings in data points and she's very articulate. I, I was honestly quite, quite surprised when she got so obliterated by the Democratic Party because I thought she was a, a good candidate. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, she's a, she's a veteran. She's got a great perspective. She's got a great attitude. I think, I think she would have been a good candidate. I have no idea what happened there. What happened? Oh, Tulsi Gabbard. So she was, she was uh, a Democrat, and mm -hmm. she was running as as a Democrat, and she didn't agree with everything that the Democratic Party was saying, and she spoke about the fact that she didn't agree with everything that the Democratic mm -hmm. Party was saying, and the Democratic Party just turned on her and obliterated her. Mm -hmm. So it was. It was, it was very interesting to watch from the outside. And they did the same thing to Bernie Sanders. You know, Bernie Sanders was very popular within the Democratic Party, but he, he, he got obliterated by the Democratic Party. So mm. it's, uh, it's been interesting to watch that. Yeah. Yeah. Politics right now strikes me as very weird. And as I try to zoom in on uh, what I think people should be doing when they're looking at their leader versus what they're doing, uh, it gets very jarring. So I'm... I'm currently exploring an idea that is, I think we've stopped using philosophy because philosophy became a stand-in for something up in the air, sort of pointless, it's not grounded, why are we talking about this? When in reality, if you get rid of philosophy, which I see as it is the bedrock from which your thinking grows, if you get rid of that philosophy, now you just have a bunch of random either facts or thoughts and there's nothing that congeals it, nothing stated that congeals it. And so when people debate, you get this sort of clown shows that we're getting right now where it's name calling, ad hominem, people, even if they're talking about facts, they're not recognizing that they have different value systems, which is what I mean when I talk philosophy. To me, philosophies, philosophy is values plus beliefs. So they're not recognizing we have different values. And so when we look at the same facts, we come up with wildly different conclusions. And because nobody stops them and goes, hey, why do you believe what you believe? 
Not what you believe, we've already heard that. You've been screaming it for the last 45 minutes. Why do you believe what you believe? So looking at that gravitational center, I think becomes critical. So what I wanna see people do is say, this is my stated philosophy, this is what I believe, and this is what I'm trying to achieve. So I'll give you mine just by way of example. Human flourishing is my aim, and thinking from first principles is my philosophy. Like one ought to build up, literally starting with physics. And then everything from there is about predictive capabilities. So if I believe uh, that politicians are going to vote in their long-term best interest of getting reelected, am I able to better predict their choices or can I predict them less? Better. If I assume that um, politicians are gonna stand by their morals, can I better predict or worse predict their, um, their actions? Less, right? And so that, that is sort of mine in a nutshell. What would you say is your bedrock upon which you build your thought process? My thought process from a political aspect or just my thought process I think of you as a political person, so that yeah. seems like a wasted question, so I'll say in life. Well, I, I, I agree that you don't very often hear politicians talking about these are the principles that I believe in. And you could, you, you could even take that further. So there's some goals, right, that if you pull any politician out of Congress and you say, hey, do you think that people should have access to health care? I mean, I can pretty much tell you that 100% of the people in the U.S. government would say, yeah, I believe that people should have access to health care. They all think that. Like, there's a sick kid. They would want to help that sick kid. There's a sick, sick grandma. They'd want to help that sick grandma. The, the disparity comes in when how do you get that health care to those people, right? Because on one side of the spectrum, it's like we need to give it to them for free. On the other side of the spectrum is if you give everyone free health care, then the health care ends up being pretty worthless. So these people say, nope, we need to charge top dollar for the health care. The other people say, oh, no, we need to give that health care for free. And what needs to happen is some kind of a balance, <laughs> right? But unfortunately, oftentimes, it just turns into an argument. I think it should be for free. I think it should be top dollar. And that's what you end up with is, like I, like I said earlier, you end up in a situation where no one is compromising, no one's trying to figure out an actual solution to the problem. And so not knowing what the, what like you're saying, not knowing what the philosophy of a human being is, now we don't, we don't need, we, it doesn't matter what end goal they're going to towards, because how are they going to get there? We don't know what measure they might take. Hmm. So... I think we have to be, I think we should be discussing those things. I, I, would, I, I would love to hear a debate between people where instead of spouting off like what you said, hey, here's some facts and figures, which the data is all manipulated and we all know you can take data and you can make it say whatever you want. But hey, what's the end state that you're trying to achieve and what's your belief in how you think we should get there? And there's gonna be changes because no one can come up with a plan that's perfect to execute anything. So you come up with a flexible plan and you start to move in that direction and then you iterate and make changes to the plan as you get closer, but you're still sticking within the principles that you believe and still going towards the end state that you're trying to reach. That's what a leader should be doing and that's what leaders should be doing instead of, well, it's not what I wanted, so I'm going to burn it down, mm. which is what we get a lot of right now. Yes. Why do you think we get that, by the way? Well, part of it is what you mentioned, right? We got people that their their goal is to make sure that they stay in their position of power. So that's what they're gonna that's that's the way they're running their business. That's the way their business being being a politician. Mm -hmm. So when they go in front of a camera, what do they want? They want to get a little more popular. Well, what kind of what kind of things get viewed in social media or on the media right now? What what gets viewed? What gets shared? It's it's emotional things. It's quick sound bites that insult someone really bad or make someone look really stupid or make me look really good or dunk on someone. All that. So that's what they do. That's what they're trying for. Hey, I'm going to go out there and make a statement that's going to get shared and that's going to get my name out there and it's going to keep me in this position of power. So instead of someone saying, well, you know, I've never really thought about that before. Let me get back to you. Does that get shared? 
No, that doesn't get shared. So they ha- they have some some remark that they're going to say. It's gonna it's gonna be inflammatory and it's gonna make the rounds. And so they're gonna keep themselves in power. And then of course they're gonna vote for things that are gonna keep them in power. They've got lobbyists that are putting money in their pockets. It's it's a it's it's a system that's it's a system that's in many ways is corrupt. Yeah. Yes, it is. And very troubling. So right now, our corrupt or corrupt adjacent system is most likely going to be putting forward two potential candidates for CEO of America, uh, Trump and Biden. If you came into a company and Trump was the CEO, what advice would you give him to improve his leadership abilities to do the things that you've laid out, which to consolidate? Uh, you want somebody who is solution oriented, somebody who understands that you're going to have to compromise to bring unity, uh, somebody that operates on a goal plan uh, execution pattern, somebody that understands that there's going to be messiness and you're going to have to work within that system, somebody that has principles that are articulatable, that are knowable, uh, that they operate on. You said all of that, and I'll add one thing that I think you implied, even when it's hard. So even when the sexier thing that's going to get you farther would be to um, be more salacious so that it goes viral to not do that and instead to anchor around principles. Um, I have a feeling my audience will resonate with that very much. I certainly do. So assuming that you're consulting Trump as the potential CEO of America with all of that as your center of gravity, what would you, knowing what he's like, what would you advise him to do or a CEO like him? Clearly, he gets himself in a lot of trouble because he's very brash. That And he gets himself in a lot of trouble because he's very brash. He also is very popular because he's very brash. And I think that the brashness is one of the things that got him into the situation, you know, that got him elected in the first place. Once he was elected, I thought, and I would advise him, once you get elected, you've used this brashness. We understand it. We understand that you use sound bites. We understand that that's that makes you very popular. But now that you're in this position, what we want to do is we want to build relationships with with the with the with everybody so that we listen to what other people say. We make sure that we're moving in the same direction. Um, and so, yeah, I would say let, let's let's build some relationships. You've 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 said a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. And actually, really, he says a lot of things that that one one part of the country finds glorious. And he says a lot of things that one part of the country finds completely offensive. And so once he was elected, I would say, all right, let's try and let's try and say things that are a little bit more center. Let's try and say things that are a little bit more uniting instead of saying things that are very divisive. Now, that brashness is one of the main things that that made him so popular because he stood up to people that so that that one part of the country never gets to talk back to and he he stood up to him and they supported that so once that again once that election takes place and you're in that position now all right let's look to let's look to unite people instead of divide them so one of the things i think that makes trump um really appealing to people is this idea of a strong man it's one of the reasons i think as i said earlier that people are so drawn to you but you're a much more interesting variant where I feel like I can track your principles. It seems like you're always operating in accordance with them. Uh, But Trump is very much a strong man. Like he's not afraid to be brash, to bully, to chastise. He said something, I think the first go round, which which love Trump or hate Trump, I think this is brilliant. Um, I may be a bully, but I'm your bully. And I think people so hunger for that to be able to draft off somebody. It's what I call the invincible winner. When you believe somebody's an invincible winner, you always want your big brother to be an invincible winner. You want your dad. When you're a little kid, that's the fantasy. Dad's an invincible winner. And there is nothing more traumatic than watching your dad, who you think of as an invincible winner, get his ass kicked. Like that, that's that would be a transformative moment for a child to witness that. Like, whoa the foundation upon which my world was built just came crumbling down. So I think that's a big part of the appeal to Trump is nobody's been listening to me and I don't wanna derail on the whole elites versus everybody else, but I think that's very real. So understand everything I'm saying is in that context where people are just like, 
my life is being run by people I don't understand. I make a living uh, in a more middle class, working class way. And this guy's basically telling everybody to fuck off. Like he's just uh, potentially a WWE wrestler, but he nonetheless is your bully. Um, how do we take somebody that has those tendencies and is known for firing people inside their cabinet and creating that instability? Would you sit him down and say, uh, tell me your principles and standards? Because this is something I know you do when mm -hmm. you go into a company. Would we start there where we're just trying to get him, hey, so that you're not constantly just firing from the hip and yeah. saying crazy shit, like we need to outline what what do you really believe in? You as the real human, or is there another first step? So it, in doing what you're saying, because that's essentially the idea, but a, a big piece for me is getting people to think strategically instead of tactically. So in, in the military, there's there's three levels of, levels of combat. You've got tactical, operational, and strategic. I don't really talk about operational very much because it's confusing to the civilian world, but tactical is what we're doing right now. This gunfight that I'm in right now, there's machine gun bullets flying at me. How do I get out of here? Strategic is, oh, we've got a war to win. Mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got brigades and divisions to maneuver. We've got supply lines to fill. We've got local populace that we need to get on board. That's strategic thinking. It's long-term thinking versus tactical is short-term thinking. So for a guy like Trump, and I've had this conversation with many leaders over the years, mm -hmm. hey, you and I get in an argument and I tell you like, all right, I've heard enough from you, Tom. Shut up and get out of my office. And, and or, shut up and leave the meeting, right? So I just do that to you in front of 15 people we've got in this meeting. Tactically, I feel great. I showed my power, let out some emotions. Other people are gonna know they better not mess with me, right? So it's a good tactical win. Feels mm -hmm. good. What happens after the meeting? People are sitting around going, I can't believe he did that to Tom. Tom was just trying to make a point. You're now saying that guy won't even listen to me. Now we got your three or four close friends are saying he's not going to listen to any of us. And now what we end up with is a problem, a long-term strategic problem because we've got a division inside of our, of our company and in, inside of our team. Remember the good old days when you'd eat a bowl of cereal every morning? Well, with Magic Spoon, you can now enjoy your childhood favorites again. Magic Spoon reinvented and upgraded cereal, so it's got the same great taste that you remember as a kid, but with better ingredients, zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five grams of net carbs in each serving. All Magic Spoon cereal is also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try Magic Spoon today. Go to magicspoon.com slash impact and use the promo code impact at checkout to get $5 off any order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in the product that they have a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code IMPACT to save $5 off today. So I would start talking to him about, okay, let's stop acting tactically and let's start acting strategically. And, and I'm not talking about his, about his global policies. Mm. I'm talking about his, basically his media and his reputational impact because he's, He's a very tactical guy. I mean, Twitter, for the most part, is a tactical tool. Like, the, it's so fast, it's so rapid. You're getting your information out there, but it's not a long-standing image that you give. It's just a tactical, oh, I dunked on this person. I made that person look bad. I made myself look good in this moment. But it doesn't help you strategically in the long term. So I would be talking to him about, okay, how are we going to think about building these relationships strategically over the next four years so that when you go and you present something that makes sense, you actually get support. There's a, there's a, a term, there's one, one term called psychological reactance, which is when I tell you what to do, most people, they don't like that, they don't like that, but there's also a psychological mechanism that we have that when I don't like you for whatever reason, oh, Tom, he's, 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 he never says hi to me in the morning. He treats me bad. He looks down on me. He, he made those couple comments to me in that meeting. 
And now you come into a meeting and you present an idea. I have an instinct, a psychological instinct to be, oh, I don't like your idea. Your idea is bad. Tom's idea is bad. I don't like Tom, so I don't like Tom's ideas. And it doesn't matter what your idea is. And we, have, we saw that you see that in politics all the time. I mean, that is basically the way politics runs is, oh, if you're a Democrat and Trump came up with an idea, it's awful. If you're a Republican and Biden came up with an idea, it's awful. We hate it. Mm. And that's the way, that's the, way the, the country's operating right now. Instead of saying, hold on a second, what is the, what's, the, what's the value of this idea? What's the strategic value of this idea? Where is this gonna put us in the long term? I don't really care where it came from. Is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? But they take wholesale everything that tr Trump does or wholesale everything that Biden does and say, uh, I hate it all. I don't support any of it. And you end up with no progress. There's no progress there. Mm. So that's what we need to watch out for. So if I was talking to Trump, I'd be saying, listen, you gotta build these relationships so when you present an idea, that by really any metric makes sense, people will say, yeah, you know what? That makes sense, let's move forward with it. And in order to do that, you gotta, you gotta build some relationships. If you don't have relationships, you're just gonna, you're just gonna get hatred. And that's kind of where, where America is right now, unfortunately. How do you build relationships with people that are on the opposite team? There's five components, in my opinion. There's five components to a relationship. Trust, listen, respect, influence, and care. And so, in order to, if, look, if I don't trust you and you don't trust me, we don't have a relationship. If, if you don't listen to me and I don't listen to you, we don't have a relationship. If I don't respect you and you don't respect me, we don't have a relationship. If I have no influence over you and you have no influence over me, we don't have a relationship. And if I don't care about you and you don't care about me, we don't have a relationship. So, I wanna build those things. How do I build those things? And the, the original idea, the original kernel of this, this concept came to me when people would ask me all the time, how do I get this person to listen to me? And you know, how do you get, how, Tom, if I want you to listen to me, what do I do? You're not listening to me, what do I do? Do I talk louder? Do I start to yell at you? No, actually, it's very counterintuitive. If I want you to listen to me, I need to listen to you. I need to listen to what you say. And by the way, if I want you to respect me, I can't say, I'm the boss, you better respect me. I actually need to give you respect. If I wanna have influence over you, I actually need to allow you to influence me. If I want you to care about me, I need to care about you. If I want you to trust me, I have to put trust into you. So if you're going to build relationships with people, what you have to do is you have to listen to them. You have to treat them with respect. You have to allow their ideas to influence you. And if you do those things, then that will open up their mind. And now you can have an actual conversation and you can try and figure out a, a good solution as opposed to just stonewalling each other, not listening to each other and closing up our minds. That all feels incredibly right to me. The one thing I worry about is that we are living in a time where uh, some portion of the half of the country that hates the other candidate, which is very fascinating to me. I feel that it's breaking along evolutionary lines, but that's a conversation for another day, but you have left and right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you're on the left, you're gonna hate the right candidate. If you're on the right, you're gonna hate the left candidate. Now, partly because of social media, we are now at a stage where people actually believe that the other side represents an existential threat. So very smart, very intelligent people, I have listened bang on about the fact that Trump is a legitimate existential threat to the country. Uh, one, do you think he's an existential threat? Do I think he's an existential threat yeah, to America? Does, yeah, no. okay, so you and I agree on that. No. And, and, and nor do I think Joe Biden is an existential threat we to America. We agree on that. America is a big, strong, giant empire. And one of these, people is not gonna take down this, this country. Now, could we get to at some point, maybe in our lifetimes, where we, we reach some kind of a point of no return where, yeah, this, this downward spiral that we're on right now is now beyond hope. Could we get there in our lifetimes? I guess, we'd have to do, we'd have to continually do dumb things. And America's done all kinds of dumb things. But normally, 
thankfully, when we do dumb things, we look around and we go, that was kind of dumb. We need, to, we need to fix this. That's why we get the kind of classic pendulum going from the left to the right. We kind of get that, that swing going back and forth. We do dumb things. We, we get ourselves squared away. We take that too far. We, we do something else dumb. We go back in the other direction. But America is a strong country. The, the people of the country. The other thing you got to remember is you talk about social media, right? Mm. And the fact that you'll see on social media that the, the left thinks that Trump is an existential threat and the right thinks that Biden is an existential threat to the country. That's what you hear on social media. Look, I have a consulting company. I travel around this country. I talk to businesses and, and, and industries all the time, all the time, all over the place. Uh, energy companies, insurance companies, construction companies, manufacturing companies, all these different companies. And you know what those people talk to me about? They talk to me about how they can build a better product, how they can take care of their client, how they can take care of their people, what they can do to unify their team. They're not talking about these, these polarizing political situations. They're talking about how do they make their company and their world better. So that's the vast majority of the country. Now, are there a bunch of loud mouths that sit on social media and, and attack each other? Yes, there absolutely are. There absolutely are. And by the way, if you get the chance, like if you get the chance to go to the mountains and you don't look at your social media for seven days while you're in the mountains, when you come back, nothing will have changed. Those people will still be yelling at each other. You didn't get any aggravation from it. It didn't impact what happened and it's going to be fine. So we could shut down those things right now and it wouldn't make that big of a difference. It's really interesting. It's a great point about detaching. Uh, I have reminded myself many times not knowing about something is the same as it not happening, at least from your perspective. Uh, so, okay, uh, you don't think either side poses an existential threat, but going back to what triggered this in my mind, uh, we're consulting Trump and you're telling him, look, we have to be more um, unifying. We've got to bring people together, love the brashness. You got yourself elected, totally respect your ability to do that with the media, uh, but that's not going to fly now. We have to stop being tactical. We need to start being strategic. We're going to have to bring people together. However, the other side does think he's a problem. And whether it's just that they want to win as a team and they're gonna use a faux sense of you're an existential threat as, as the pushback, the reason to shut the door, whatever. They're going to do that. But I really believe the thing that you laid out is absolutely true about what has to be done. So in terms of building a relationship. So now the question becomes when you have somebody who, I mean, just swimming with sharks, right? So how do you befriend a shark? Somebody who is politically motivated to never give an inch with you. Let's also, have you ever seen those um, compilations where they have the past, I don't know, probably 20 elections where people are saying this is the most critical election in the history of our democracy and our democracy is at stake? Yes, they, for they, sure. They're going to keep saying this. So let's not get too crazy there. Our, our democracy is going to be okay. And like I said, could there be some things that we could do where we could get to a point where, yeah, we can't recover? We could get there. We're not even close. We're, we're not even close to that right now. Okay, so now I've got someone that is a, a complete antagonist to me, d just wants me out of that job, wants to take care of themselves. What do I have to do? I've got to do the same protocols that I just talked about. You've got problems with me, Tom. Come in and let's talk about those problems. You, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to allow what you're saying. I'm going to try and understand your perspective. I'm going to actively try and allow you to influence what my plan is. I'm going to make that happen. I'm also going to consistently and repetitively ask you why you want to do something. Mm. What is the outcome that you're looking for? Why, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to spend money in that? marketing campaign, right? If you and I are working together, you come in, look, Jocko, you're shutting down all of our marketing. We need to put money into this marketing campaign. Okay, well, talk to me about why. Well, because that is a, a group we've never talked to before. Okay, do you, what makes you think they're gonna want our product? 
Well, I got this market data. Oh, okay, so you just taught me something. I didn't know about this market data. Tell me more. And all of a sudden, when I open my mind and I start listening, I can say, oh, I didn't know that we had market. Let me see that market data. Oh, you're right. This, this would have a good impact for us. Here's something I didn't tell you, Tom. The reason we pulled back all of our marketing budget is because we're losing money and we don't have much left. Oh, so now you're thinking, how can I do this more effect effectively and efficiently and save money while still addressing this new market that we have an opportunity in? So now we start having a conversation and guess what we start doing? We start solving the problem. So if I go, yeah, you know what? Tom's just a, he just always wants to spend money. He's a maniac. Uh, he's going to come into my office and, and you say, hey, I'd like to spend some more money. We're losing money. You're talking about spending money. We're losing money. It's because you don't understand. Get out of here. It's a fail. But if I say, all right, Tom, tell me, tell me what you want to do. Tell me why you want to do it. Let's, let's try and find a solution to what's happening here. Our country doesn't do that right now. And, and look, you don't have to go back that far. 15, 20, 30 years where these these government officials, these elected representatives on both sides of the aisle, they were friends. They had conversations. They talked to each other. They went to banquets together. Like that's what they used to do. They don't really do that anymore. So we've completely thrown these relationships out and it's a problem. So if you want, if you're in an organization, which as you said, the the government is an organization and you're trying to solve problems, you have to work together. So guess what I have to do as the leader? I have to put my ego in check. Look, Tom did everything in his power to make sure I didn't get elected. He said nasty things about me. He said horrible things. He lied. He tweeted a bunch of stuff. He brought up stuff from my past. He's, he, he hates me. Guess what I have to do? I have to say, okay, you know what? What's more important than my ego? Our country. What's more important than mudslinging our country? So you've got people in our government that put their own agenda, their own ego, their own personality, their own election above the most important thing, which is America, our country. So until, well, there's two things. Until those people in those, in those positions recognize that and then until we as voters recognize that what we need is someone that's going to affect change, not someone that's going to yell and scream. So I want to vote for someone that is going to build relationships and, and affect change. I, I'm not voting for someone. The reason, oh, I'm voting for this guy because I saw him on social media and he really blasted the other side. He really made the Republicans look like idiots or he really made the Democrats look like idiots. I'm going to vote for that person. No. It's like, wait, wait a second. What did you, what did you accomplish? Have you, you know, a... Uh, uh, I don't know when this is coming out, but we just signed like a $1.3 trillion bill. And I just really quickly on my way up here was going through it to see, you know, like what we're spending money on. Trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars mm -hmm. that, that we're spending money on. It's a bill that's a thousand pages that has to be voted on like t today yeah. or tomorrow. No one has time to discuss that. And I get it that there's staffers that run the numbers and put those things together. But guess what? When I'm in a position, when I'm in a leadership position, of course, yeah, I'm going to have my staffers and my subordinate leadership put things together and I trust them, but I still need to go through those numbers and assess what we're spending the money on. And that's clearly not happening. You can't do it. You can't do that on a thousand page bill in 24 hours. You can't do that. So that's what that's what that's what's happening inside of our government right now, and we as voters apparently we're okay with it because we keep voting the same people in there. Yeah, that that becomes a complicated question as to why we keep going for it. I think a big part of it, it's not the only part, and in a conversation like this, there's a certain amount of simplification you have to do just to have the conversation, but the velocity and volume of information can be leveraged as a weapon. I see people do it on social media all the time. Trump is a master at this, where he's just gonna give you another crazy thing to deal with you know, 45 minutes later, and so each thing more crazy than the next, and just you just sort of get numb to it. Same thing, you give somebody a thousand page bill and 48 hours to go through it, uh, you're gonna skim. You're just gonna try to find out like what are the things that I know they're trying to sneak in here. I'm gonna look at that and I'm gonna ignore everything else. And then once it's a part of the government, man, getting rid of it is very hard. Now you said something though that I wanna go back to. Um, so you were saying that 
what's more important than my ego? America. This is where I start to get distressed. So I grew up in the 80s and be, America was the best as an American, obviously. And I always believed if you live in England, you should think England is the best. If you're in Japan, you th should think Japan is the best. India, India is the best. But if you're in America, you should think America is the best. It's your team. And it that was just like obvious that America was the best. It was in all the movies. I mean, the just the, the heyday of all of those movies where, P.S., it was a guy with an accent, nine times out of 10, Schwarzenegger, whoever, that was American. So, you know, it wasn't necessarily homegrown, but it was this ideology that we could all believe in around freedom and that you could rise from the bottom to the top, all of it. So that idea is tied to something, I can't remember where I first heard this, but the idea that we all need to kneel before something. And if there's nothing to which you will kneel, you're, you're gonna get caught up in your ego. And so I'm very curious to know, one, what is it that you think people ought to kneel before, whether it's the family unit, the American flag, whatever, and then in a world now where you have Americans that hate America so much, there was a kid, I forget what, um, what school, but there was a, a high school kid who was told he had to remove the American flag from his car because it was considered offensive. I was just like, what? That's crazy. If I was to try and figure out something that I think people should kneel before, I would say freedom. And the reason I say that is because there's Stand some the people chills. that there's some people that would choose to kneel before God. There's some people that would choose to kneel before the country. There's some people that would choose to kneel before a different God. There's some people that would choose to kneel before science and academia. And, and, and I don't think that I or anyone else has the authority to tell people what they worship, what they look up to and what they kneel before. So therefore there's only one thing that protects you to do any of those things. And that's freedom. So if you're going to kneel before one thing, in my opinion, it should be freedom. And you have the freedom to kneel. That gives you the freedom to kneel before whatever you want. So that's what I think on that case. On the other case of why people might start to lose sight of the fact that America is, a, is an awesome place is because they're spoiled. We're, we're super spoiled. We're super spoiled in America. It's, it's amazing. And if you, you know, if you've got, like I've got kids, and if, you know, I think if my kid says, the Wi-Fi is, the Wi-Fi in my bedroom is, I only got two bars in there. Guess what? I'm, I'm a good dad. You know what I'm saying, right? If, if, if we're complaining about like, oh, the Wi-Fi in my bedroom isn't that good, you go to another country, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no bedroom, there's no bed. So we're at that point where we, <laughs> as a nation, some people in this nation are complaining about the fact that they don't have Wi-Fi in their bedroom or they don't have strong enough Wi-Fi signal in their bedroom when they forget the fact that there's some people that don't have Wi-Fi, some people don't have bedrooms, some people don't have beds, some people don't have houses, some people don't have roofs. So metaphorically, look, what, what, what is going on in this country? Well, all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of people with all kinds of different ideas. And they're saying wild things and they can say them. And they have the right to say them. And that's okay. So what protects people's ability to say those things, freedom. And what protects freedom? America. <laughs> it's, it's, it's your first amendment, right? You can say what you want. That's what's happening. So just like a spoiled kid that, you know, I, I wanted the convertible Mercedes dad, right? That, that actually happens. You go and talk to like some rich 18 year old kid that got a Mercedes for their birthday and it wasn't the convertible. They're mad. So do we have some of that in America? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. There's places in the world right now, if you go into those places, you do not have these freedoms. You do not have these freedoms. You can't kneel before this God or that God. You can't participate in academia. 
There's all kinds of parts of the world where you don't have these freedoms. So I would recommend when someone, when I talk to someone like that, I don't say, you're an idiot. No, I say, well, what is it you don't like about America? Because America is far from perfect. America's flawed just like any person's flawed. We're, America's made up of humans. Human beings are flawed. Human beings make mistakes. There's, there's all kinds of things that America has done that are absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. Yeah. And while we, when we do things that are terrible, what, what do we do? Do we continue down those paths? No, we try and fix ourselves. We try and fix ourselves. And if someone, you know, if Tom was a drug addict and now he's clean and you come and apply to a job, for a job with me, do I say, ah, you, sorry, you were a drug addict. I, I, I don't trust you. I don't like you. Or maybe you just failed out of, you dropped out of high school. And then you went back and you got your GED and now you graduate. Nah, no, you, you quit high school. So that means you're no good to me. No, people make mistakes. And we as, as a country have made mistakes. But we try, we strive for, we strive to be better. And on top of striving for to be better that whole time, we've done our best to protect freedom. Human freedom. That's the most valuable, that's the most valuable thing in, in, in life is, is freedom. So we, it's very easy to forget that. It's very easy to forget that in America, especially. It's, it's so easy to forget that because we absolutely take it for granted. We absolutely take it for granted. We do whatever we want. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I gave a speech the other day and I was talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The, the, that's, that's, that's what we're founded on. And I was talking to some veterans and, and what I was saying is that that's what veterans put on the altar of sacrifice. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When you join the military, you're not, it's not about your pursuit of happiness anymore. You're going to do this job. That's what's going to happen. Liberty, you're not going to do what you want. You don't have freedom. They, 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 it's shocking. That's the shocking thing about going to boot camp in the military is your, your freedom is gone. Your freedom is gone. Your pursuit of happiness is gone. You're no longer, look, and I'm talking about boot camp. Of course, eventually, you, I have had, I had the best times ever with my friends in the military. But you go to boot camp, that pursuit of happiness is gone. The freedom that you had. You, you're going to get dictated what you're going to do. What time you're going to wake up, what time you're going to go to bed, what you're going to do all day, that's going to get dictated to you. And finally, life. You're going to put, you're going you're gonna to possibly sacrifice your life for freedom. So that's what the military does. Very small percentage of people join the military. Normally, normally military people appreciate freedom. Why do they appreciate freedom? Because they had it taken away. They were put into a job where it's like, hey, you don't have very much freedom anymore. And like I said, eventually in the military, there's, you have to have an open mind to have victory. Like there's, there's a bunch of things. But when you go to boot camp, all those things are taken away from you. That's one of the reasons why military people generally are very patriotic. They've had those things taken away from them. Part one. Part two, they've gone to other parts of the world and they've seen what other parts of the world are like, especially parts of the world that are run by tyrants that have, have no freedom. And when you see that, you get home and you're very thankful. So what do I kneel before? Or what do I recommend people kneel before? Or what could we universally kneel before? I think the answer is freedom. Are you surprised that we have tried to bring freedom and democracy to countries that don't seem to want it? Am I surprised? No. Because just like any other leadership situation, if I try and impose my way of life on you, you're not going to like it. That's not freedom. And that's what happens. We've, we've, we've done a poor job. In some cases, when we gradually introduce things, when we, when we allow freedom to flourish without forcing it down someone's throat, it, look, what's your favorite food? Let's just go with Chinese to make it easy. Like specifically. Oh, orange chicken okay. and so egg fried rice. I'm going to take orange chicken and egg, egg fried rice and I'm going to cram it down your throat. That's less fun. Doesn't it? No matter how good a food tastes, it doesn't taste good when you cram it down someone's throat. Mm. So when we go in and we try and impose our culture on other cultures, they reject it. 
Of course they do. We're trying to force it down their throat. When we gradually, or when freedom is gradually exposed to other cultures, over time, they nod their head and they say, yeah, that looks like a good deal. We, we want to get in on that. And that's why, that's, that's, that's what caused the spread of democracy throughout the world. Not, we didn't spread democracy through the sword. When we try to spread democracy through the sword, it doesn't work or it seldom works. What you have to do is show people what's out there, show people the opportunities and, and allow them to find their own path. Yeah, agreed. Values have to find their way into culture otherwise. And freedom, I would say, is, is simply a value that we happen to hold very aggressively in the West. The thing that maybe makes me more pessimistic than you, um, long term, I think we're going to be fine. But I really do, for the first time in my life anyway, feel that in the West, specifically here in America, we are adopting ideas and values that do not lead to human flourishing. So uh, if if somebody's trying to map my thinking, they, they have to understand that's what I'm pointed at. And then they would have to understand what I think leads to that freedom being just a huge part of it. And I believe any culture that doesn't have that is not as close to human flourishing as they could be. I'm not saying that it's a bad place to be. I've been to some countries that don't have that. Uh, and certainly it's lovely. But I think there is a reason that... Um, we've been able to create the things that we've created, the level of prosperity, the level of growth, the fact that so many people from all over the world want to come here uh, is for the ability to choose what they kneel before. I think that's a, a really important concept. Uh, but I'm watching what's happening in America and I see people that the value system that's burning through culture is now one of, I would much rather be safe. And in fact, I want to step back. What do you think people are trading freedom for right now? If you agree that it is its primacy as the defining value of America is slipping, uh, which I certainly believe that it is, what are they trading it for? Is it safety? Is it power? Is it something else? I would say that you have to have limitations on things. And that's just a constant, it's a constant sort of balancing act between freedom and I guess for lack of a better word, discipline, but, but law, you have to have law and order in, and, and that has, there has to be some level of structure and rules that people are going to follow. And that, that component expands and contracts, you know, with, like I said, a pendulum, a pendulum that's going to swing back and forth. It expands and contracts. And sometimes they impose more laws and once laws start getting imposed, usually at a certain juncture, people say, wait a second, you've gone too far with these laws. We don't, we don't want these laws anymore. And you go back in the other direction to where, all right, now we've, wait, wait, somebody needs to put some restrictions over here because this is totally out of control. So it's a balancing act. And, and what we have to realize is that th we're going to bump up against the guardrails and it happens. And, and laws get put into place that sh shouldn't get put into place and, and then they get rejected and all laws get removed and all of a sudden things get a little bit out of control. So I, I think what you're witnessing, I, don't, I would say that it's not necessarily a, a drift towards tyranny, which it sounds like you're talking about a drift towards tyranny. Very much so. Yeah, I think that there is a, the guardrail that prevents us from going into tyranny, we're, we'll bump into it. And when we bump into it, we get straightened, we get straightened back out. There's, there's plenty of Americans that recognize when that, when the, when the control and the order is being imposed on them and it's getting to be too much and they push it back and say, yep, that, that one we're not buying into. I think it was an interesting, you know, during the, the, during the pandemic, the level got, I think, it, I think it kind of reset some, some parameters because there was a level of control that was imposed. And I think most Americans had grown trusting enough of the government that they said, well, I guess the government's trying to help out here. And you could see that in the beginning, that's kind of what most people thought. Well, the government's trying to help out. They're doing their best. And then as time went on, you start to get the people, the guardrail <laughs> that protects freedom, they started to get louder and louder and say, hold on a second. And, it, and I mean, what do you think would happen if 
they said, hey, there's another variant of COVID right now and we're going to lock everyone down again. What do you think would happen? Uh, I think there would be massive protests. Yeah. I think there would be no lockdown. I think there would be no lockdown. I don't think that. I think it would become hyper-regional. I think that uh, if you're in a predominantly blue state like California, where people still sometimes wear masks mm -hmm. here, which I'm, I'm just, what? Uh, so I think it would become tribal and people that back themselves into a corner by saying, no, I stand mm -hmm. with it. It had to be this way and all that. Now they have congruence. They will lock down. Other places will be like, absolutely not over my dead body, never again. And now you've got the people that like, there were those guys that had the gym that just refused and refused and refused. I don't know if they finally got arrested. Yeah, yeah, they I were getting fined and stuff. And now you have them to look to. So you can be like, oh, okay, I want to be like that. I'm not going to be tricked this time. So I think it, you, you would have rival factions. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, I, I always want to remind myself things. How, bi how big are the factions, percentage-wise? Well, so the country breaks almost exactly 50-50. Uh -huh. So then the question becomes, how intense is the spectrum on either side? I think it's a very small number of people that will take to the streets. But living in LA, man, in 2020, uh, from my balcony, I actually watched LA burn. Yeah. And somebody yeah. posted uh, an image of my house and said, burn the rich. And so it was like, this is real. Like you, you can feel like when a mob breaks. Did you see that recent footage of the um, girl that got her head beat against the yeah, pavement? I saw it. There's something that happens when the crowd snaps. Oh, for sure. And for however long a period of time, they're not human per se. It it just becomes the mob. And so I agree with you. I think our democracy is robust. I actually don't have fears about that. I think those fears are way overblown. But I do think. At the street level, it could get pretty nasty pretty fast. And maybe it's just these quick spikes yeah. punctuated. But um, yeah, I, I can feel that we're testing the veracity of the guardrails. And that makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. I won't even say that I see the bolts wobbling, which I think some people look at January 6th and they're like, the bolts are about to shear off. I don't have that same sense. But it does make me uncomfortable. And, and this is exactly what happens. Jocko, here is my worldview. Mm -hmm. Everything is, is uh, built up from the ideas that a populace takes on board and makes their invisible value system. They don't realize they've done it. It just becomes an idea. And this is why when you ask them about it, most people, they can't answer. And their argument falls apart and people laugh and like, oh, look how dumb they are. That's the wrong way to look at somebody. That is a person who is in the grips of a bumper sticker they heard an idea that's memeable because it's simple and therefore it can spread. And now when you ask me, I have a simple retort and I just say the whatever the slogan is. That's what happens. And so when freedom is the slogan, I feel great. When live free or die is the slogan, I'm here for it. Uh, when it becomes authoritarian slogans, which I'm beginning to hear, I get very uncomfortable. And so, again, things are almost never as bad as you think they're going to be. They're never as good as you hope they will be. So I, you're probably right that we just bash up and against these things. But I'm a, a just obsessive student of history. When it breaks, it breaks so terrifyingly that I have made myself a, a promise that I will not be one of the people that remain silent and so maybe I'm speaking up a little early, maybe it's a little ridiculous, but if you read the Gulag Archipelago or Mao the Unknown Story, and you realize 100 million people killed, like in horrible ways, humans are capable of tremendous evil. And I never wanna lose sight of that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of there, there has to be, there's a lot of personal sacrifice that would have to occur that to, 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 for things to, to actually break. Like, for instance, it's, it's shocking. The American Revolution is shocking because the guys that led the American Revolution were willing to sacrifice their way of life, which was they were a bunch, they're, like the wealthy landowners, they were the rich guys, they were making money for the most part. And they decided, you know what? We're not gonna be under this tyrant anymore. We're gonna fight. They, they, normal, 
normal humans go, eh, dude, I'm not, look, I, eh, you know, I'm going to kind of stick with what I got. That's how, that's how things do slowly drift over time. But I, when you've got a, a, a plentiful food supply, when the people that are rioting because they've, because of the misjustice they've suffered, but they're doing it with a $1,200 cell phone that they're filming everything with. There's a lot of things that, there's a lot of sacrifice that would be, have to be made that people aren't, aren't, people don't, people wouldn't be willing to make. Mm -hmm. They might make it for a night and they, you know, during, during the riots and everything, there was like, those sacrifices might've got made for a night, but that was about it. <laughs> That's actually a really uh, comforting take. I remember when the Chaz Chop yeah, yeah. thing was happening and it was like, this is not going to end well. This is going to devolve. But I never read it as, oh, yeah, they stopped having fun pretty quick. And they backed off for yeah, no well, other reason that, than that. Actually, when it happened, as it was happening, I was like, oh, yeah. Well, let's see how long this lasts. Because people, people take for granted the infrastructure that we have in the country. Mm -hmm. People take for granted. the the Remember the couple of scenes from the Chaz or the Chop or whatever when – something bad was happening and the, the, the people in the chopper yelling, call the cops, call the yeah. cops. It's like, yeah. So people talk a big game, <laughs> but there's a lot of sacrifice that would, personal sacrifice that would have to be made. And, and in my mind, the people that are, that would actually be willing to make that sacrifice are the ones that would stand up to protect freedom. Hmm. And people that are, would try and impose tyrannical rule in America, I don't think they. I don't think they would have the willingness to sacrifice. It's a really interesting take. Um, George Washington is certainly who I thought of when you were talking about the um, people that fought the British, because to your point, he was wealthy, uh, and I remember there was a period where he was like building a new foyer or something in his uh, house back in Virginia. Um, to host parties and things like that. And he's literally looking at plans on the battlefield and sending it back home. And for him, it was, this is, this is my only way to sort of stay sane, is to remind myself, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna fight for our freedom because it matters that much to me. But one day I really do wanna get back to that. And it becomes this really magical moment in our history. And, and look, just so I don't have to, I try to, to predict the comments whenever I can. Yes, I'm well aware that George Washington was a slave owner. Uh, obviously, horrendous. That, that is a cultural moment more than anything else. Anyway, we'll set that aside. I, I understand that. But you also had a guy that for years and years and years lived in the muck, in the cold, constantly risking his life, putting himself out front. There were times where bullets would go through his jacket. Like this is not somebody that you know stood at the back and let his men um, be at risk when they had to cross back over the river in, in one fight in the, uh, in the mist and everything because they were trying to escape because they knew they were about to get slaughtered. He was like, I will not cross over until I'm the last person to do so. And people were freaking out. And they're like, please, like we need to protect you. You have to get across. He wouldn't do it. Anyway, becomes the first president, has the opportunity to effectively become the king of America. People ask him to, they want him to stay. Uh, and he does his terms and he says, no, I, I remember that space that I was building that I used to fantasize about on the battlefront. I'm now going to go do that thing. I don't want the power. And that's the kind of thing, like, it's like in the Lord of the Rings when the one elf holds it for a second. She turns into like almost like a demon, all powerful. And then she calms herself down and hands the ring back and said, I needed to know if I could pass that test where I could hold the ring, know that I am now in this moment all powerful. I could kill everybody before me and go rule the universe. But no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand the ring back. And those values to me, like the things I just said, like that borders on pornography for me. I'm just like, that's so rad. Like I want to, I want to be that kind of person and I will not claim to be, but man, do I aspire to that. That to me is really cool. And yet I know if I were to hang an American flag outside my house, you and I know a person, I won't call him out on this podcast. Uh, he was here at the house and he was like, oh, I hung an American flag on my house. I was like, that's going to get ripped down. And he goes, it already has. 
And I was like, I hated that that was predictable. And then I hated that it had come true. But all the things that I just said is what the American flag represents for me. But because I believe bad ideas are sweeping across the youth mostly, the American flag now represents the one part of that conversation where I was like, yes, I acknowledge that he was a slave owner. And so if I'm right that ideas matter, then it becomes very important that the right ideas get propagated because the bolts in the guardrails, in my estimation, are the ideas that people believe in. And if those ideas go, the guardrails go. Well, I guess I have a little bit more of a positive attitude than you in the fact that I, I really, I believe in freedom and I believe that freedom wins. I believe that, I believe that f freedom wins. And so as I see the guardrail get hit, as I saw the, see the bolts start to come loose, as I see people's minds start to explore the idea of tyranny and control and authoritarianism, I believe that freedom and light defeats that darkness all day. And look, it's a battle. It's a battle, but it's a battle that, that freedom wins because I think that inherently human beings, especially Americans, but human beings want to have freedom. And is there a part of human beings that wants, is, is there a part of some human beings that wants to control other human beings? Yes, there is. There is. Is there a part of some human beings that wants to make sure that other human beings are free? Yes, there are. And in, again, this is, these are my beliefs. You asked about my principles and, and my guiding philosophy. I believe that freedom is superior. It's the superior mode of human existence. And because it's the superior mode of human existence, it wins. It, it just wins. And again, it can be tumultuous. It, it's a battle. It's a fight. There's blood. But it wins. Is that in the long arc of history it wins? Or in the any one human's lifetime, they can expect it to win. It's the long arc of, of humanity. Mm. And look, it can get snuffed out for extended periods of time. But I mean, we've, we have seen that in our lifetime. You know, we got to see the Berlin Wall come down. We got to see, you know, we got to see what it was like when you don't have freedom. And as, as John F. Kennedy said, we've never built a wall around America to keep people in. We don't have to do that here. They have to do that in those countries. They had to do it in those countries. They still do it in, let's say, North Korea. Right? You're not allowed to leave. We don't have to do that in America. We have to build a wall to keep people out because everybody wants to come here. So that idea of freedom is, is a powerful thing. And I believe that it is the, I believe it's, I believe it's part of human nature. And yes, there's part of human nature that wants to, that, that there's some part of human nature and some human beings that want to control other people, but they don't have the, they don't have the, for lack of a better word, they don't have the right. They don't have the right to do that. And so you can try it. Look, and, and if we break this down to a, a smaller scale, you work for me, I'm your boss. I can rule you tyrannically, right? I can say, I want you showing up at six in the morning. I want you to have this stuff done for me. You better work. You, you don't leave a minute before five o'clock at night. I can be a tyrannical leader like that for you. And I can control you. And by the way, if we have 20 employees and I can be a tyrannical leader for all of them, and guess what? They will have to listen to me for a while. But eventually you go, hey man, I'm gonna start my own company. You guys wanna come with me? And every single person says, yep. And what happens in these tyrannical countries? Over time, eventually, and, and, and like I said, the more extreme measures that are used by the authoritarians to keep and subdue human freedom, the longer they can, the, the, the more they can prolong their eventual downfall. And so when I look at a country that's being run in a tyrannical manner, I think, yeah, they're gonna prolong, they, if they're very authoritarian, if they're not afraid to use violence, if they're not, they're not afraid to just kill people like they did in the Soviet Union, hundreds of millions of people, or in 
China, like, oh, we, we're going to, people are going to die. We don't care. If they do that, they can suppress, they can suppress the, the, the instinct for freedom that human beings have for a certain period of time. But I don't believe that they can actually extinguish the flame of freedom. I don't believe it's possible to extinguish the flame of freedom infinitely. That, that flame can't, you can subdue it, you can suppress it, and you can do that for generations. And maybe, I don't, I don't know if this has happened, maybe you can, you can get control of that, of that instinct and subdue it to a point where, where it becomes a, a nominal factor. But even then, even then, man, you know, there's people in the world that that little ember of freedom is like what is in their soul. And it doesn't matter what you do to them. I mean, we know these. These, these are our patriot, patriots that formulated this country. That said, give me liberty, give me liberty or give me death. That's what they said. You couldn't, under threat of death, you couldn't extinguish the ember that was burning in their soul for freedom. So can you tamper it down? Yes. Do I worry about anybody or any system truly being able to extinguish the spark of freedom in the soul of mankind? I don't really think that's possible. I don't think that's possible. I love that, man. And maybe the slight pessimism I have is only one of time scale. Um, I, again, just you look at enough history and you start to see, uh, guess what? Nature does not care about any one person's life. And so, yeah, there might be the long arc of history, I actually do believe bends towards justice. It's just that is of cold comfort to one of the people that is, you know, snuffed out at 15 or whatever, because the tyrannical government comes in and was like, we didn't like something your dad said at parliament today. And so now you're dead too. Um, there's just so many crazy stories like that. So I'm, I am very inspired by what you were saying. Like literally I could hear music playing in my mind as you were talking, like I'm so motivated by that stuff. Um, and am very much a person, Lord knows I hope I'm never tested. Um, but I like to believe that I am a person that would sooner die fighting for freedom than that would just roll over and accept a tyrannical government. Um, I don't, beat that drum too hard because until tested, I'll just assume I'm uh, going to be weak in, in the wrong moment, but I do need to remind myself not, not the path I want to walk. Uh, so yes, all of that's amazing. I just think it's, it's a very cold comfort. And so in any one moment, I think um, it matters whether we have a lot of people like you or we have who, who would die clearly willing to die for freedom. In fact, let me ask you, when you were in Ramadi, were you fighting for freedom or was that something else? Yeah, we were. We were. And on a strategic level that we were talking about earlier, was that what we were fighting for? No, we weren't fighting for freedom on a strategic level. There was no threat to my family's freedom in America. So from a strategic level, we were implementing the policy of the United States government. That's what we were doing. However, on the ground, at a tactical level, in the city of Ramadi, there was extreme, tyrannical elements that eventually became ISIS, but at the time was known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And what they were doing was oppressing, violently oppressing, the local populace in that city that cowered in fear because they did not have the capability to stand up to the insurgents. And we did. We did have the will, we had the capability. And we also had the capability to help train the local populace to step up and eventually handle the violence and the insurgents within their own city. So 
we liberated that city from the insurgents. And when I say we, I mean the incredible soldiers and Marines that were on the ground with us, the Iraqi soldiers that were on the ground with us, the Iraqi police that eventually took over, that prevented their, the, the insurgents from coming back into Ramadi, the local tribes that united with coalition forces to stand up and take care of their own neighborhoods because they wanted to be free. So were we fighting for freedom in Ramadi? Yes, we were. And we won. Yeah, I would imagine that would be very hard to do something so dangerous, to see people dying, to take life, and not have a pretty extraordinary why. Um, did you guys talk about that? Like, would you rally around, like, this is a battle for freedom. These are the bad guys. They are oppressing, raping, murdering, and we're going to stop them? No, our why was a very simple one. The enemy, the insurgents in that city, were killing Americans, first and foremost. They were killing U.S. soldiers and Marines. Then you go to two or three memorial services for a 23-year-old soldier or a 19-year-old Marine, you recognize that there's sacrifices that are being made and we know that we could help. And then on top of that, the civilian populace in the city of Ramadi, you know, there's like two components of your emotions that get pulled at. One of them is, oh, they killed a, a freaking 19 year old Marine or a 23 year old army sergeant or a 30 year old army captain who has a family. And then on top of that, you see what they do to the civilians. You see what they do to a, a 14 year old girl where they rape and abuse her. And then they, then they behead their father. And then they skin the mother alive. That's what they Jesus. did. Jesus. So, it it doesn't take if you're if you're a good human being, and you're over there. The why is is self evident. It's evident as soon as you see these things that are happening, and you're part of a part of a, a task unit, a SEAL task unit. You're part of a army company or a marine platoon or whatever. You see that happening, and there's there's no need to sit down and do a daily discussion about why we're doing this. You know why we're doing this. We, we're doing this because there's evil and the evil needs to be stopped. And we're here, we have the power to stop it. We have the capability to stop it and we're gonna stop it. That is super heavy. When somebody dies, if you're consoling, whether it's their fellow brothers in combat or their family members, um, me as the outside layperson who's never actually gone through that, it's interesting, my brain goes to, they died to protect freedom, right? Something that in the reality of is hopelessly generic. What do you actually turn to? Is it um, they were courageous, they protected their brothers, they, like w in that moment where somebody who loved them comes smack up against the, the just pain of it all. How do you make sense of it? Yeah, it's, it's Yes, I've had those conversations, and yes, the answer is number one, they're protecting their friends and brothers. That's what that's what they're doing. And on top of that, they were doing the right thing for the right reasons, trying to protect the civilian populace from from demonic evil. And that's what it is. You know, you and, and it got it became more clear when you saw the activities of ISIS, what they, what they did in, in Mosul. But those same elements came from Ramadi. They came from Fallujah before that. They, so the, these were the same people. They just got a different, they, they rebranded. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what it is. How do people become evil? I mentioned earlier that there's some people that have, you know, the tyrannical bent to their personality and they want to control other people. I don't I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know whether it's nature or nurture or a combination of both. I I would imagine it's some kind of combination of both. But it's there. Hmm. Do you enjoy history? I do enjoy history. So have you read about um, the Wild West and as America begins their expansion mm -hmm. and especially coming up against the Comanches, have you read that part? Mm -hmm. 
Um, that, I mean, look, this is me, God. It's always interesting having these conversations with you because you've lived it, and for me, it's just stuff in books. But um, that opened my eyes, maybe more than anything, to the circumstantial cruelty of humans. And what would happen on both sides of that was horrendous in ways I can't imagine, from skinning people alive, raping them, kidnapping them, killing them, torturing them, like on both sides, uh, finding a pregnant woman and cutting her fetus out and um, slicing it up in front of her. I mean, just what is happening? Things that I would otherwise not, my, it, it is a pure failure of my imagination. Like I never would have thought through those things. So it's interesting. Uh, it feels to me, so Solzhenitsyn, um, for people that don't know him, wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago. He was in the Russian gulags and uh, he writes this book about his experience and he, he creates the what is now a pretty famous line. The line between good and evil runs through the center of every human heart. And I found that distressing when you start looking at history at, okay, how do people break bad? And I think I mean, going back to my central thesis, I think people get caught up in ideals and there's no doubt the My Lai massacre shows you can have one guy that's like, what are you doing? Stop killing immediately. And then everybody stops. But you also have those same ordinary men two minutes before killing innocent civilians. And it's it may be some of the slight difference that we see this in is that like, I'm so afraid of how the mob breaks. I'm so afraid of how an idea can grab a person or a group of people. And for a minute, they just are suddenly doing horrendous things that you can't imagine. Uh, there's a book called Ordinary Men uh, about, I think it was a Polish, I forget. It, it was- They a, went to Poland. Okay. Yeah, they they were cops yep. before that. And then they get sucked in by um, Hitler's forces and they're trained to kill people in just the most horrendous ways humanly possible. Um, and, and they end up doing it and going from ordinary men to just savages, savages on a level that I can't comprehend. So yeah, I do think that maybe, I think that the human psyche is maybe more fragile than you think it is, or maybe I'm just focused on a more narrow timeline because I swear I am optimistic, I love people. Uh, but even I, like as I have more of these conversations, find myself representing the more like, now I'm a little unnerved yep. part of the camp. Well, the both those cases, this is a leadership. And you're right, in, in the My Lai Massacre, there was a leader Lieutenant William Calley, and he, his attitude was, he had a terrible attitude. He had a, a, obviously a, a, a vein of evil in his soul, and he led those guys to rape, mutilate, and murder about 500 innocent people in that village. And so all those people were so malleable, the troops were malleable, to go along with that. And as you mentioned, it was Hugh Thompson, who was a helicopter pilot that flew over, saw what was happening, intervened, went back to headquarters and said, hey, they're out there massacring people right now. You need to stop it. They made one radio call and said, stop killing people and everyone immediately stopped. So what does that mean? That means that when leadership leads people in the right direction, they will do good things or they will do evil things. And that that's exactly what happened there now a little bit more positive thing is when the, when those events are viewed from the outside people recognize that it's terror it's 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 atrocious it's a war crime it's, it's horrible and and same thing when we now what 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 is it that intrigues us about the the book ordinary men what why is it why is it read to this day because people look at it and go oh, okay we got to watch out for that Everyone says we got to watch out for that as an individual human and as a group. We don't say, how do we do that again? That's not what we're saying. So we say, oh, that's a warning. Unit 731, have you read that book? About yeah. the Japanese, what the Japanese did to the, to the Chinese. That's, it's the same, it's actually an even more extreme level of evil. It's, it's medical experimentation, Ooh. absolutely heinous. So when you have leadership that's evil, they will lead people in an evil direction. 
And, you know, in those cases, they get viewed from the outside. When people, when people get out of that mob, they look at it and say, this was wrong. Even the guys that were in My Lai, the, the young 20-year-olds that were in My Lai were like, yeah, we, I lost my mind. I, it's obviously, it's horrible. They didn't look at it and say, oh, no, it was kind of cool. They didn't say that. So, again, a little bit of a, you might think that the mob leans a little bit, breaks a little bit bad. I'm going to, in my opinion, look, can the mob break bad for a period of time? Yes. And this is something I teach leaders all the time. When you're in charge of an organization, you're a mob leader. You're in charge of the mob, but you can't be in the mob. Because if you're in the mob and the mob starts doing things that are they shouldn't be doing and you're in the mob, you won't see it. You can't be in the mob. You've got to be outside the mob. Look, sometimes when you're a mob leader and the mob starts doing, they start doing positive things. You've done it in your companies where everyone's doing the right things. Everyone's moving in the right direction. You don't have to restrain the mob. You can even encourage the mob a little bit. But even then, you can't get into the mob. You need to take a step back. You can't be in the mob when you're in a leadership position. You need to be outside the mob. Then if they do start to turn and they start doing something negative, you can stop it immediately. So as a leader, you can't get caught up in the mob, you need to be stepped back. You need to be detached. If you're not detached, you're going to be emotional. You'll be caught up in the mayhem and you're going to allow things to happen that shouldn't be happening. You're not going to see what you should see. So we as leaders have to take a step back, detach, look at what's happening and, and actually lead, not follow. Hmm. All comes back to leadership. So let's step back. We uh, did some consulting for Trump. Let's do some consulting for Biden. So you walk in to this company called America and the CEO is Biden. What advice do you have for him? Well, I, I think it might become pretty evident at this point that the things that I'm gonna tell Biden are the same things that I was gonna tell Trump. I, I'm, but is that in reality? Because if the, what I expected you to say was, this is gonna be hard with somebody that I'm not sure is functioning at the level that he needs to function. Yeah, okay. Well, from that perspective, yeah, I, I, I guess I kind of jumped the, jumped ahead a little bit or I gave the benefit of the doubt that, you know, I had somebody that was, had the cognitive capability to, to, to understand what we were talking about. And yeah, um, I, what I would probably do is talk to him and see where he's at. Mm. Uh, certainly from the, from the outside, it doesn't look like he's got a great, you know, cognitive awareness of what's happening. So I would want to, yeah, I'd want to talk to him and do an assessment of where he's at from from a mental perspective, and and see what we're dealing with. I think that's pretty straightforward. All right, let's assume that it's like okay, uh, we can see over the years you're obviously off a step. But let's say that his ability, when there's not a lot of stress, he can still process the information, he's still able to lead in accordance with his own principles and all that. So you walk away saying, okay, I, you know, we're, we're not dealing with dementia here, we're dealing with decline. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to manage that. How would you, um, I've heard you talk before, like know thyself, you have to understand what you're good at, what you're not. And so, yeah, what would you say, assuming for the sake of the argument, it's not, it isn't dementia, but it is, it's a performance decline. Well, actually, I think, I think that conversation, whoever consulted with that administration is already doing that because clearly you don't see Biden out answering questions. He, he doesn't do press conferences. Like they're not exposing him to scenarios where he's going to have the opportunity to say things and, and, and not say things that are going to really be bad. And so he just has, you know, he's very insulated from, from interacting openly with other people. And, you know, I, I watched the state of the union address. Mm. Like I was, I was surprised that he was able to actually carry the whole thing. So they did a good job of getting him some good rest, getting him some good supplementation or something to, to get <laughs> him very kind to get him up to a point where he could deliver, you know, an hour long address. And, you know, he's reading from a teleprompter, so it's yeah. not that hard. But, you know, they were able to pull that off. I think, I think that it's back into hiding. And yeah, if I was, if I was the, 
if I was the consultant that was brought in, I would say, yes, let's keep him from the public view, keep him from interacting in any large capacity because when he does speak, when he does get out there, when he does get asked questions, he's not, he's not really, he's not that coherent. Mm. And so it, I, I, would, I would mitigate that as much as possible. Yeah, makes sense. Let me ask, if you knew that we were going to go to war with a country and you wanted to use psychological warfare either to um, nullify them completely or at least weaken them a little bit, what would be certain ideas, values, beliefs you would try to pump into that country to weaken them militarily? <laughs> is this a leading question? <laughs> uh, not really, but I find that it is, it's really, again, the driving force for me is ideas. This is all ideas. Okay. And so, so yeah. Um, here's what I would do. I would, I would not put a single value into that country. What I would do is I would put opposing values into that country and I would try and divide them so they're arguing with each other, so they hate each other, so they rip each other apart. That's what I would do. I would fuel the fire of divisiveness as much as I possibly could. Mm. So whatever little granules they had that separated them, I would emphasize those, I would grow those, and I would cause a civil war. That's what I would do. How often are you checking your credit score, afraid of identity theft or account breaches? We all use the internet every single day for important things like personal banking and remote work. So why not protect yourself with our sponsor, Aura? Aura is an all-in-one cybersecurity service that keeps you safe online. Aura identifies data brokers exposing your info and submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Aura also monitors your credit, tracks your passwords for data breaches, and secures your online activity with with VPN and anti-malware protection. You can try Aura for free for two weeks by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. Yeah, I suppose it did turn into a leading question. Do you see uh, any of those similar traits happening right now with social media being sort of the self-inflicted wound? 100%, 100%. That's what we're, we're destroying ourselves. When someone is listening to this right now, and they're a far right person or they're a far left person, and they're listening to this right now, and they're saying, um, I can't believe that Jocko said that about Trump. I can't believe Jocko said that about Biden. I can't believe Tom is, is hinting. When you have this anger and, it, and it's polarizing you, you're, you're, just, you're, you're falling a victim. Hmm. You're falling a victim to it. Instead of being like, oh, Tom's got an interesting perspective there. Oh, geez, what, that must be weird when you see a picture of your house and cities on fire and they're saying kill the rich and you're a rich person in one of the houses that they're identifying that damn that that must feel weird instead of saying you're damn right what do you need all that money for tom right so we th that's what that's what social media has been doing and again it's just playing on human psychology because if someone said put a picture of your house and said that's I bet that person worked hard. No one's retweeting that. No one really cares. But if someone puts a picture of your house and says, kill the rich, people are going to retweet that. It's emotional. Mm. It's going to strike a nerve. Saying, oh, that's a good architecture. No, one, no one's retweeting that. Very few people. So we're, we're trained and we're psychologically impulsive to retweet what makes us emotional, either very angry or very v triumphant. If your house was on fire, hell yeah, here's a picture of this rich person's house, they're losing their house, hell yeah. That's triumphant, I'm gonna repost that. So yes, social media is not helping our country. And if I was an enemy of this country, I would do everything I could to fuel the fires of division within this nation. Do you think that China's doing that with TikTok? Yes. Oh, shit. This is actually an issue I haven't thought about. Uh, tell me more. Well, I, it's not just TikTok. I think that when any of these, you know, what you, you, I'm sure you've heard these figures that the groups, there's groups on Facebook that 90% of their members come from our, our Russian bot farm. Mm. And you've, I'm sure you heard those stories. Rogan had guests on there that talked about they set up like a, like a 
Patriot March across the street from a Black Lives Matter March and in somewhere in Texas. Two group, these uh, social media groups, hmm. some some patriotic people on one side and some Black Lives Matter folks on the other side. They set up marches on like the same street. It was all just fabricated. And then supporters of those two elements going to show up, going to cause problems. But the, 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 the pages that set up those marches were not Americans. Hmm. So this is what's happening. And we're buying into it. Americans are buying into it. Americans are buying into saying, don't listen to that side. Don't listen. And our politicians are fueling it too because they're trying to shore up their support as rigidly as they possibly can. So they fuel it as well. And they say, Trump's the threat to democracy and Biden's a threat to democracy. And that's what they're doing. Dude, wait, Biden's a threat to democracy? All right. Trump's a threat to democracy? Oh, all right. So our own politicians are fueling it. Social media fueling it. Foreign interest, absolutely fueling it. Everyone has a big ego, so they think they know everything, even when they don't know anything. So they dig in in their positions, and once they're dug into their positions, they get attacked, so that makes them dig in even more. It's, it's, uh, that's the phenomenon that we're living in right now. Hmm. Do you see? I don't buy into it, by the way. Uh, like, when I see some, some rhetoric, inflammatory rhetoric, has no impact on me. I go, oh yeah, I, I can see that's inflammatory rhetoric. I always say I'm a, when it comes to like online sales or even salespeople like trying to sell me something, I'm the worst person to sell anything to. You know, when they hit me with all these things, it's like, yeah, I, I know what you're doing. I hope that more people start to recognize what is happening to them when they have a strong emotional reaction to something that's been created to give them a strong emotional reaction. You shouldn't be having a strong emotional reaction to things that don't involve your immediate family. How's that sound? That's interesting. Is that a rule for you? No, I said it off the top of my head. But if I'm looking at a piece of news, it's propaganda. It's propaganda. There's very few sources of information right now that aren't aren't woven with some kind of propaganda and some kind of agenda in them. So therefore, if you know that, you learn to look at that for what it is. It's a piece of information that has been doctored or spun or manipulated to give you an emotional reaction to affect your assessment of what's actually happening. And if you don't know that, you're going down the path following a leader that's leading you to a horrible place. If you recognize, oh, I see what's happening. This is clearly written in a way to make me emotional, to make me share it and retweet it and comment on it. That's how they wrote it. That's what they did. That's what they did. And they're good at it. That's why you're seeing it. So stop it. Look at it detach from it, don't get emotional about it, try and understand what the facts are, but don't allow their perspective, and not even just their perspective, it's not their perspective, you wanna understand other people's perspective, don't allow their warping of information to warp the way you think. Mm -hmm. That's what people, uh, I think a lot of us in America are falling victim to that, and the 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 fact that it's so readily available the the idea of an infinite scroll the the, it, the idea of likes and dislikes the idea of clicks and the whole nine yards it's all it's all led us to this point where what we're producing for consumption of information is highly emotional highly polarizing and that's what's selling for lack of a better word right now. Yeah, I think the average person is is ridiculously easy to manipulate because the human mind works in a certain way. You're very famous for this idea of detachment. Uh, that's clearly gonna be part of the answer to what I'm about to ask, but how do you form your opinions so that you're not just sucked into what has the most emotion, what's most viral, what's most simplistic? Um, how do you take in data, actually seek to understand the other side, 
and then still form an opinion? What does that process look like? I, I think one of the premises that I kind of avoid is actually forming an opinion or having an opinion that's formed because that means it's not moving anymore. And I don't like to do that. I want to have an open mind. Mm. I want to say, I, I want to look at any, any idea or any situation or any piece of information that comes in and think that this is a perspective that's going to change. I, I talk a lot about a, a statement about being in the military, which is the first report is always wrong. And there's a reason that the first report is always wrong. Because Tom, when you're in the field and you send me a report that says, we're under attack, we're gonna get overrun. There's hundreds of other enemy out here. That report is gonna be wrong. Not gonna be completely wrong, but it's only your perspective. You only see, you're only seeing what you're seeing. You're being impacted by the emotions of the situation that you're in because you're scared and you're adrenaline fueled and you're emotional because you just lost two guys. Like there's a lot of reasons why what you're telling me is going to be through a lens that is not 100% focused and it's not, it's, it's not able to capture everything that's actually happening. So that's what, that's what goes on with the news. The first report comes in, I look at it, it's like, okay, there's a report. I don't know if it's right or wrong. There's some data points. Guess what? In a little while, there's gonna be more data points. And a little while after that, there's gonna be more data points. And I'm going to start to see some granularity in a picture eventually, but even when that picture appears to be clear, I know that there are other components and other perspectives that I'm not seeing, so I don't complete that picture in my head I have an image and I recognize that that image is probably going to change and that issue, whatever it might be, is probably going to morph still in my head. Okay, so you've got all these ideas flying at you. How do you, uh, you're aware of the potential manipulation. You're aware you don't want to close your mind, but I assume you also know that at some point you have to make a decision on how you're going to act. So how do you decide what ideas to keep and what ideas to reject? I call this the iterative decision-making process, which means I'm going to make the smallest decision that I can. I'm going to take the smallest step that I can, and then I'm immediately going to reassess the feedback that I get from that decision that I made and what does my view look like now. So this is this has been this was very helpful for me when I was in the military. This has very been very helpful for me with my civilian companies, and it's very helpful when I'm thinking about issues that come up in the news. So. When I see something, I go, oh, I guess I got to make a, a small decision. You know, if we we're out in the field and we start taking fire, I don't say, hey, everyone run away. No, I say, oh, everyone, let's, Tom, go to the rooftop and tell me what you see. So you go to the rooftop and you get a better picture. You say, oh, Jocko, there's just one guy with an AK-47. Cool. All right, cool. We don't need to run away. In fact, we can move forward and I can continue to make small steps like that. In the business world, you don't go, hey, there's a, a part of town we're not in right now. I'm going to go buy a building, hire nine employees to run the retail area. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put a kiosk on one of the corners down there. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see what kind of crowd we get and see what kind of product we sell. And then if that goes well, yeah, in you go two years, maybe I buy a building because it's a hot market after I put five kiosks in all the neighborhoods and realize it was great. And it's the same thing with these, whatever issues we might be discussing from a political perspective. Oh, what, what should we do in Ukraine? What should we do in Gaza? What? Oh, I don't say, well, just run away from Gaza. Let, 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 the, let Hamas have it. Or I, contrarily, I don't say, oh, just level Gaza because... Hamas attacked? No. It's like, oh, well, let's do an assessment. How about we get first control over the situation? Same thing with Ukraine. Well, okay, Ukraine got invaded. What should we do? Attack Russia? Well, I, that doesn't sound like a good idea. World War III, the Ukrainians, how can we support them? How much support do we give them? If we continue to support them, what's the outcome look like it's going to be? Is it going to be significantly better if we support them or might it get to a point where it's not better and I'm going to make small decisions. I'm not going to make big giant decisions. I'm going to make small decisions and I'm going to continually assess. And that's what I'm doing all the time. Mm. And that's what a good leader does do. 
is looks and makes small adjustments and pays attention to the feedback. And this is where our egos get involved. Because I say, oh, we got to, this happened in, oh, we, we took fire, Tom. We're going to attack. And now we start to attack and Tom starts going, hey, actually, Jocko, I think there's a lot more people than I thought there was going to be. And I say, doesn't matter. I said attack. We're going to attack. And we keep going forward and we all get killed. Because I didn't take the feedback of, oh, Tom first said there was one bad guy up there. Now he's saying there's 38. Now he's saying there's 300 and we only have 30 guys. That's not good odds. We don't want to get in that fight, but I made the decision, so we're going forward. Mm -hmm. And people do this stuff all the time. Instead of saying, oh, you know what? I was actually wrong about this. Hey, I was wrong about putting a kiosk in that neighborhood. Yeah, yeah that, there's, that's not our market. We're going to shut that thing down. It's going to cost us another eight grand because we had to rent the kiosk and everything, but we're shutting it down. It's not like, oh, I dumped $4 million into this building and we're going to make this work. We're losing money, we're losing money, we're losing money. We got a business. Mm. We're bankrupt. Why? Because I didn't make small decisions and make adjustments based on those decisions. Yeah, it's very intriguing to me that you're so known for your military career, but this stuff is now applying so directly to business. And it really, really tracks the idea of um, the first note I took when you were talking about that is just getting the information. You're trying to figure out what's what. And so being humble enough to know, I don't have enough data points. And so I'm going to gather data with an open mind. I'm going to figure out what's going on. I'm going to place a small bet, but as small as I can to get a realistic answer before we you know, overcommit. Really, really smart. Um, you brought up Ukraine and Russia, um, obviously knowing that you're very much on the outside of this, but how in terms of the small moves that you'd want to see made, um, how do you want that to play out if that feels like something you can talk to or how do you think it's going to play out? Well, how do I want it to play out? I want there to be peace and I don't want any more of these kids to get killed. Even if we have to compromise, they have to compromise. Well, yeah, I think you, got, you have to compromise. You have to compromise. And I think that they will end up compromising whether they want to or not, the Ukrainians. And it's going to be a huge price in blood and treasure for the Ukrainians and, and for the Russians as well. So it's a terrible situation. It's a terrible situation. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of lives being destroyed um, because people couldn't sit down and talk and figure out a solution. Mm. War is a test of wills. And the reason you go to war is because you're not sure whose will is stronger. Because if you knew whose will is stronger, you'd settle it at the table and not on the battlefield. And we, we make mistakes on interpreting other people's wills and how strong their will is. And, you know, the Vietnam War is an example I like to give on this is the, the Battle of the Idrang Valley was one of the first big battles that took place and Americans killed the, the Vietnamese, the, the North Vietnamese, on a scale of about a, 150 to 1. Whoa. Yeah. And after that battle, the, the thought was, oh, well, we can win because we just have to kill 150 of them for every one of us that die, and that's how we'll win the war. We just proved we can do it. And what we didn't realize is our one meant more to us than their 150 meant to them. So they were willing to sacrifice. They had the will to sacrifice at a much greater rate than we did. And we killed millions of Vietnamese. And we lost 58,000. Wow. And every one of those is a tragedy. And at the end, we said, yeah, we're, we're leaving. And you can ha you can you can have this country is basically what we said. We didn't say that, but in effect, that's what we said. So, when you sit here and you look at Russia and Ukraine, it's a test of wills. Well, the Ukrainians, this is their home. This is their home. This is their freedom, which I talked about earlier. So, how strong is their will going to be? It's going to be as it's going to be strong. It's going to be as strong as imaginable. And then on the other side, you have Russia. 
How much does Russia, how much does Putin care about the level of sacrifice that's made? We don't know, but we're starting to see. I, I would say we kind of know. We, we're more familiar now that he's not that concerned. So that's what we have. We have a test of wills because each side thought their will was going to be a little bit stronger. And, and guess how we find out? We find out by fighting. And we find out by killing each other until it's over. So, again, I think that the Ukrainians are, their will is absolute. But they also lack the numbers. And unfortunately, they're in a war of attrition. Because when you ask me what I think of it or what I think would be the outcome, I was in the beginning of the war thinking that Ukraine would fight a guerrilla war, an asymmetric war. And they have entered in more of a, of a conventional war. And this is, this is a, a, a conventional war, for the most part, very quickly turns into a war of attrition. And now it's, we have more people than you. We can make our ammunition faster than you. And look, America can keep sending bombs and guns, but at a certain point, somebody's got to wield those bombs and guns. And it's, if it becomes a war of attrition, which it is absolutely morphing into, that outcome is not going to be good for the Ukrainians. Because they don't have the same number of soldiers. They don't have the same number of people. What sucked them into a traditional conflict? I think it happened because they they were able to achieve some some what appeared to be and what felt like conventional victories. So I'm sure you saw images of of, of patrols and convoys of Russian vehicles going in and being bombed and being and and it looked as if oh this almost looks like conventional warfare it's these tanks against a smaller number of tanks but against conventional type forces maneuvering against the russians and they were winning which they did but when you knock out 20 russian tanks and you feel like it's a win and it is a win until the russia sends 20 more tanks or when you kill 50 russian soldiers and you lost five guys, you think, hey, that's a win. And it is a win. It's a tactical win. But then the Russians send 50 more soldiers and 50 more soldiers and 50 more soldiers and 50 more soldiers. So war should be the absolute last option. And I, I think it got moved up in the, in the, in the list of options, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah, it does not feel globally like uh, people are waiting until the last second for war right about now. Uh, I would have said 10 years ago, probably, that maybe we really are at the end of history. That's certainly how it felt. Didn't feel like there was going to be any of these sort of conquering nation vibes uh, anymore. And obviously that, that tweet would have uh, aged very poorly had I sent it. So the question becomes, how do we get them to pull back? So... Again, you talk about detachment. So they're trying a strategy, probably not going to work. If you went in to advise them, I assume it would go something like, uh, guys, play this one out. Doesn't end well. You're not going to be able to match them troop for troop. So I get it. A lot of reputations on the line that this is the right play, but we just have to look at the data and say this isn't going to work. Then what? Go, go back to guerrilla warfare? Would Gr that be their only shot? Guerrilla warfare. Yep. Guerrilla warfare. And do you think there's just too much political machinery in the way for that to happen? Or why haven't they figured that out themselves? I mean, the, the, and don't get me wrong, they are doing some guerrilla type warfare, but they also get drawn into, oh, this is our city, we're going to hold it. Mm. Is that the problem? That like it's a the, raccoon the, trap that, that or a type of thing, trap? That type of thing has happened. Mm -hmm. This is our city, we're going to hold it. We're going to fight for it. It's like, if you fight for it and you kill a thousand Russians but you lose a hundred Ukrainians, okay, there's gonna come a thousand more Russians. 
And I'm sure you've seen pictures of the, the young kids that are now putting their uniforms on in Ukraine. And they're going to go fight. Um, this, is, this is what happens. Mm. Human capital. And yes, if I was there advising them, I would be telling them to fight a guerrilla war. No, guerrilla war doesn't feel good if you're, if you're a country like Ukraine. These are proud soldiers in a country that has a trained military. It is, it is the, it's almost the antithesis of the way they would think to fight and the way they would want to fight. They would want to fight man to man on the battlefield and guerrilla warfare is not man to man on the battlefield. It's roadside bombs, it's snipers, that's what it is. And if you've been on the receiving end of roadside bombs and snipers, it's horrifying. So, but you'd have to kind of culturally change them to have the attitude that we're going to fight an asymmetric war against a numerically superior enemy, mm -hmm. which is what they're facing. Who's the greatest guerrilla force in history that you've studied? The greatest guerrilla force in history? Uh, there's, there's, there's tons of them. I mean, you already mentioned some of the some of the Native Americans that were out there on the plains. They were they were outstanding. Uh, obviously, you know the, the the Viet Cong, they were outstanding. They carried tra uh, tanks over a mountain range. Yep. that's insane to me. Yep, yep. And I mean, the history is just filled with. I mean, look at look at Afghanistan. That was. They didn't, that wasn't a conventional war. Mm. That was, we left. Russia left. Russia left. England left. So 3 and oh. are they good at what they're doing? Yeah, they're good at what they're doing. It also shows you how powerful asymmetric mm. warfare is because uh, a force that's untrained, that doesn't have the technology, but they have time. I mean, I'm sure you heard that about the Afghans. Like the Afghans were like, oh yeah, you guys have bullets, you guys have bombs, we have time. This is where we live. That's what, the, that's what the Ukrainians have. That's where they live. They have time. And to try and fight the Russians in that way is bad. And then once that happens, the Russians, what the Russians should do is say, hey, look, we don't want this kind of beef. We don't want, because you try and occupy a country, which is what Russia would have to do, or occupy those, those regions, now you've got occupation forces. Occupation forces get picked off for a year, three years, five years, 10 years. And eventually they go, all right, we don't want to do this anymore. That's what America said in Vietnam. That's what America said in Afghanistan. But look, we, we don't want to do this anymore. So... That's the way, and, and I actually, you asked me how I think this will play out. I think that is how it will play out. It's just gonna take a much larger amount of casualties to get there because I don't think the Ukrainians are gonna surrender or anything, but they're gonna get to a point where they can no longer attempt to, to fight face-to-face -face against the Russians, so they're gonna be forced into a, into a insurgency and then it'll be a long drawn out process. Mm -hmm. I th that was when people had originally asked me about what was gonna happen. I said, this is gonna be a 15 year war. It's gonna be an insurgency by the Ukrainians in the occupied zones of the Russians. And that didn't happen. It didn't happen because it turned into a, a conventional war. Very much a conventional war, not a total, but a much more conventional war that is not as advantageous to the Ukrainians. Do you have a read on Putin? What do you think are his ambitions? There's been much debate about, um, is he an imperialist who's not gonna stop until he's gobbled up all of Ukraine? Is he really just trying to create a border from uh, NATO? Do you have a sense? I could tell you my sense. I don't know if, I don't, I don't wouldn't put much weight on mm -hmm. my assessment. Um, so I, whether it's worth even chiming in on, I, I don't know. I, I mean, we, the West definitely pushed Putin and cornered him. And Putin is the type of guy that you can't corner. You need to give him a way out. You need to give him a, a way to save face. And I don't think we did a good job of doing that. 
Um, he's a proud guy. And when you corner someone that's proud, this is why people are worried about him using nuclear weapons because they know that much about him. He's a proud guy. He's proud of his country. And you corner a guy like that, you don't give him a way out. They do dumb things. Ego, right? Yes, indeed. All right, I have to ask because I actually want to know. Uh, you get elected president and uh, Putin's like, all right, I, I'm going to beat this guy in jujitsu and then we, we can call the whole thing off. Mm -hmm. Can you take him? Yeah. Yeah, he's, 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 a, ju he's a judo practitioner. Mm. And so he's going to be very good, skilled on the feet. And he's going to have, ju judo also has excellent groundwork as well. But how old is Putin right now? I think he's 70 or pushing 70. Yeah, yeah, he's going to have real problems with me if that's what it's going to come down to. Um, but I think, yeah, I, 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 would take, I would take Putin. Now, somebody, uh, I asked for uh, fans of yours for things they wanted to ask that nobody's ever asked. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, how hard do you choke? So since we're talking about uh, tapping Putin, mm -hmm. how hard do you choke? Uh, I mean, till people tap. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not that big of a deal. That mean, it's weird, you know, for you, like choking is a big deal. But for people that do jujitsu, it's just, it's like, how hard do you shake someone's hand? It's like, right. that's just the way things go. And that's life. And you get choked and, and Putin's an old guy. <laughs> and if a 70 year old guy had to fight me, it would be a bummer. You know, like if I had to fight a 27 year old guy, jiu-jitsu champion it'd be a problem for me right and, and i actually do that pretty regularly and it's usually a problem <laughs> so uh all right so there are two major conflicts in the world right now um what's your take on what's going on with israel palestine uh is that going to play out tactically as um they just keep bombing from the air have they already started backing off from that i think i heard they had um are the tunnels going to be the problem like how does this one play out the way it's going to play out I think that Israel is very determined to completely eradicate Hamas. Do you think they have a metric by which they judge that? Like they obviously don't have a roll call of who everybody is and you go find them and when the checklist is done, you're done. Or do they? Um, I bet they have pretty good intel. I mean, there's the, the, once you start having intel sources inside of a country, like you can know a lot about what's going on. And I bet you they have a pretty good roster. You know, whether they have a roster that's down to a man, I don't know, but they, they know. And I think they've determined that they need to eradicate Hamas. And I think they're going to eradicate Hamas. And I don't, it, it certainly does not appear through their current actions that they're going to relent at all until they've gotten Hamas eradicated. Do you think the international pressure for them to uh, dramatically drop the body count will force them to go tunnel by tunnel, house by house? Or do you think they're just going to be like, ah, fuck it. Like, we're just going to keep bombing. The bomb, you still, once you bomb, you still have to go in. So they're going to have to go in one way or the other. And so I, I think they're going to make the judgment on that question, not based on international pressure. I think they're going to make that judgment based on when they are tactically ready. They feel like they've gotten to a point where they can go in and do the street to street, house to house tunnel clearance, then then, then they'll do it. But I don't. I think the inner the international pressure came so quickly that it didn't like mount. The international pressure didn't mount. It just it pegged, it redlined, and it's just staying there. And I think Israel's sort of saying, okay, well, that's the international pressure. It's redlining, but we're going to keep doing what we're doing mm. until we get this threat completely eliminated. Do you have fears of that escalating? It's going to cause years and years of strategic problems for Israel because they're going to have to, you know, people are going to seek revenge on them for the next hundred years. So do I think it's going to be an issue? Yep. It might be some short-term thinking for them. Yep. Is that the mode that they're in right now after they have their you know, people massacred. Yep. How close have you looked at that situation in terms of the historical context? Decently. Is this intractable on anything remotely approaching a realistic timeline? Like sure, maybe over a thousand years it unwinds, but is this something that can unwind in the next two generations? No. 
not there's zero options. Zero options. Hmm. What is the sticking point? Um, lack of forgiveness and egos. So if you and I have a problem and whatever happened in the past, we can't forgive each other, we will not have resolution. Hmm. And there's been atrocities on both sides and there's enough people on each side that will not forgive that the people that will not forgive and will not move forward will continually drag the rest of those both sides down. Will they drag them down or will they suck them in? Suck them cause? in, drag them down, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. To me, there's a very big uh, chasm between those two ideas. So idea number one is that hatred is so powerful and I can rally you around your hatred and the misery, the squalor that you live in, and I can pull that front and center, and I can say they've done this to you. And not only um, as, as an act of divine justice must you strike them down, um, but it's the only way forward for us to finally have what God wants us to have, we have to do this. That's sucking them in. Um, sucking them down would be, uh, hey, Please stop. Don't don't strike them again for the love of God. Like let us just live our lives. And then they go strike anyway and then you get bombs and so I I am not close enough to that problem to understand like whether the populace is like no, we we elected them. This is who we want to lead us and they're right and this is just and this what's happening to us now is is merely more proof of the injustice of of these people that have held us down for so long. Uh, I don't know if that's how they read it or if it really is like, oh, my God, like if we could just get leadership in here that wasn't um, constantly provoking them, we could finally achieve balance of some kind. The answer is yes. Both those things are right. occurring. And there's there's both people that are wishing that they there's people in, in both Israel and in Gaza that are wishing that the damn governments would stop and we could just like carry on with our normal lives and and shake hands there's people in both those elements i mean you see protesters you see protesters in israel you don't see them so much in mm -hmm. in gaza right now uh, but there is there is there was like I, I saw images and videos of people in gaza lashing out at hamas especially when it comes time for aid to get delivered so there's there's people on both sides that 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 would just assume hey We've had enough of this. Let's shake hands and let's carry on. And there's also people that are completely. So what was that? Well, that was sucked in, or is that sucked down? Okay, uh, that's sucked down. And there's also people that are sucked in on both sides right. that are like, nope. The only way what, that this is what they did, the Israelis right now, October seventh, and whatever other the, the countless other atrocities, and then the the Palestinians and their land and their atrocities and you take both those things and they're not going to stop they're not going to forgive they're not going to forget and they're going to fight all right let's say that you were living in a portion of america that became qualitatively like palestine is right now that feels like warlord territory for me which you have somewhat jokingly said if things ever got bad enough uh, I would just become a benevolent warlord. Uh, I would take over. And you, at one point you said something like, I wouldn't say that I was stoked if we were at end of days, but uh, I'm ready for it. Um, what, what would you actually do? Like, so I don't, you may not know this about my background, but uh, I actually came up as a writer, film guy. Uh, I've written screenplays, comic books, all kinds of stuff. Like in, and I love the quote about a science fiction author that your job is not to forecast the automobile, it's to forecast the traffic jam. So you're trying to figure out like, okay, what I know about humans, how, how is this gonna play out? So it, I get I'm asking you to imagine a fictional scenario, but in said fictional scenario, knowing what you know about you and other people and what it would be like, because I'm going to assume you'd be trying to lead people to something better and more hopeful, and, um, but that you actually have the ability to be violent, to be dangerous, to, um, back down the the dogs at the door so what would that really look like if there was some sort of an apocalyptic event yeah. that took place 
where where legitimately, I mean, I'm trying not to say what would, if you were in Palestine, what would you do? But like, if you were in a situation just like that, where you've got bad warlords and they are holding the population hostage to some extent, uh, it's rubbled the fuck out, man. I mean, this place is just, you're, you're literally getting MREs dropped from the sky. Mm -hmm. And that is the only way that you guys are subsisting. You just watched however many years of billions of dollars of aid pour in, and it all went to military tunnels and stuff like that. There, it did not go to projects that make the people's lives better. Uh, knowing that your um, the core thing that you build up from is freedom, um, ready go. Do you start like being that charismatic leader that organizes people, or do you find? The person that's going to be the mouthpiece, I would say you've got so much credibility, I'd expect it to be so you. So I, 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 I hate to um, drill down like this, but are you talking yeah. about a hypothetical situation where there's a apocalyptic event and now there's mayhem going on? Or are you talking about if I was a Palestinian right now in Palestine or, sorry, in Gaza, mm. what would I do? Those are like very different okay. questions then then we'll start with you're in gaza right now but you're you are palestinian so mm -hmm. that you're you're one of the people what yep. would you do well the the other assessment or the other assumption that we have to make is that i'm palestinian i'm in gaza but i have an open mind right so yep. i i my mind is my mind is is free to assess what's happening. Yep. So yeah, if I was there right now, what I would do is I would start looking around going, okay, the situation that we're in is absolutely horrific and we cannot continue down this road. What is happening? All right, do the, do the Palestinian people around me, the, my friends, my family, what, what, what's happening with them right now? What do we need to do so that we can secure and stabilize our lives and our like small area, our building or city block, whatever the case may be. I'm gonna get that thing stable and secure. And one of the ways that I'm gonna be able to do that is my family, my friends, my close friends, we're gonna to start to secure my area. And then guess what? I'm gonna go across the block to the next people over and say, hey, what's going on with you guys? Where, where are you at? How many people you got? How many, how many able humans do you have here? Cause we gotta make some things happen. Number one, we gotta figure out a way to get the food that's getting dropped onto the beach. I wanna help us get that done, and I wanna do it in a, in a way that we can help as many people as we can. Right now we got injuries happening because people are fighting each other for that stuff. So let's get some control over that. So that's what I would do. I would start very small with my family and my immediate friends and getting some kind of control over a small area. Once I have control over that small area, now I'm gonna start expanding that. And what we're going to be looking to do is we're gonna be looking to stabilize things as opposed to dis destabilize things. And and so what do I have to do? That means uh, the Hamas guys that are down the street will be like, hey, you guys, you guys are getting bombed. You're not gonna get us bombed. So you don't come over here. If you go come over here, we're gonna have a problem. And I'm gonna go to the border and talk to the Israelis and say, hey, uh, you guys are bombing us? Don't bomb here. This is gonna be a problem if you bomb here. So don't, here's where we're at. So I would start to try and communicate and I would start to try and build relationships with these two opposing elements so that I could best support the people that I'm trying to now take care of. Man, uh, I love that. This is the beginning of something very interesting. So I don't know how far we'll be able to take the hypothetical, but at each of the things you're describing, I'm able to track how you view the world in a really interesting way. Uh, so your first safety, right? So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're gonna just make sure everybody's sheltered, they've got food, they've got water. Uh, then we're gonna try to stabilize access to the resources that we're going to need. Then we're building alliances, whether it's with the person next door or whether it's with the, um, the other military. And in fact, as you were going to first Hamas and then the Israeli military, I could feel you reaching out to who are the bodies that matter? Like what, what swings the needle here? Let me identify those things, go out and do it. It's what's so interesting about that analysis is that is exactly what you do in business, except nobody's shooting at you. 
Um, but in terms of like, okay, where are we at now? We need to stabilize. We need to gain access to in business capital. I need the resources. I need to know what my run rate is. How far, how long can I either lose money or how much profit am I making to be able to scale and grow? Um, keeping an open mind, getting ego out of the way, knowing who to talk to, but also there's a little bit of threat in the shit that you say, which, uh, I just come back to is I think a big part of the reason that people you're an archetype for people and that they keep wanting you to run for president because they hunger for that archetype. They hunger for a strong man with the tactical and strategic ability to do that, who has a set of morals, which I think is so important, which I think you've called principles. Um, yeah, that's kneeling before something, which you didn't specifically say in this, but it feels like you're kneeling before the family, the people on your team. I'm here to serve you. I'm gonna make sure you guys are okay. I have to imagine that would be a lot of the rhetoric as your coalition building. Like, look, treat us well. Don't do anything fucking stupid. We've got your back. You're gonna be well taken care of. Um, how am I doing so far? Yeah, trying to get people to think more strategic about what's happening. And, and hey, this is where we are right now. We can lash out over here or lash out over there, but where does that get us in the long run? Where does that get us strategically? And if it's not going to help us strategically, then we shouldn't be doing it. Hmm. So that, that ties into what I would be saying to my people. What would you do? Because here's the thing I think in reality you would run into. Um, you have an implicit goal in that, which is I want everyone here to thrive. That's my goal. And so that's what I'm working towards. Uh, you're going to run up against people who their goal is to punish the enemy. What would you do when it's, they understand your goal. They just don't buy into it. They have a totally different goal. How would you handle that? Yeah. What's, what's your long-term strategic goal look like? Cause you're saying you want to hurt the enemy. What does that do? Where does that get us? Cause we can go hurt the enemy tonight and Hey, we can go hurt the enemy on October 7th, right? That's exactly what they did. They, they hurt Israel badly. Where's it gotten them? So that's what it's, it's getting people to think strategic instead of think tactically and getting people to think with logic instead of think with their ego and their emotions, which is not easy. And you can't just, you can't just say, don't get emotional. You can't, you can't pull emotion and ego completely out of the completely out of the calculus of your decision making, but you have to weight them a lot less because I've got people, same thing with the Israelis. The Israelis can't be like, hey, they attacked us. So, but you know, we can't get emotional. We need to have a measured response. Like, no, it's like, you have to put that emotion into the calculus. My wife and daughter and son were just murdered and we need to do something about it now. Like, okay, we gotta, we gotta take this, it's real. The emotion is real. So you got to put that in the calculus. At the same time, you also can't let emotions be the heaviest weight in your decision-making process. You can't let your country's ego be the biggest weight in your decision-making process. You, do you, does it have to have weight in there? Yeah. But it can't be the biggest weight that's now driving you to do things that don't make sense in a long-term strategic way. Mm. Yeah, that's why to me this all comes down to goals. Uh, because if your goal is simply to hurt and kill as many people as you can on your enemy side and that death for you is perfectly acceptable, there is no problem with that. Uh, in fact, it is simply the gateway to eternal paradise. That's where it gets tricky uh, and probably part of why this is so difficult to unwind because in the emotion of they must be hurt, justice must be served, divine justice, and if I die in the service of that justice, that's fine. Um, you now have a loop because you, you don't have a way to back them out of that by saying, well, I have a better goal for you, right? Look at your son, your daughter, because my initial reaction, and I still believe the following statement is true, but it's probably incomplete and probably a little naive. Uh, but when I think about whatever the solution is going to be, the solution is going to involve Palestinians believing that their kids have a bright future. And the second they don't believe they have a bright future, all hope is lost. Now, them believing that their children have a bright future, now that comes down to definition of bright future. Uh, and if bright future is being a martyr, that becomes more problematic. Uh, so anyway, I fully acknowledge that I'm thinking through this. I'm so early in my thought process. I do not have enough of the information, but I do think it's valuable. 
uh, for people to leave breadcrumbs about how they think through a problem. Um, so yeah, very, very interesting. All right, uh, I wanna go back to something that you said a minute ago. You were saying, I would go over and ask, how many able-bodied people do you have? You didn't say men, and I'm assuming you didn't say men for a reason. What are your thoughts about female leadership in battle? Well, in a situation like that where we've got a limited number of people and I can take females and put them on sniper rifles and put them into positions where they can utilize their skill sets that they have, that's, of course, in any, when you have an existential threat, you're going to, you're going to need everybody. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons Israeli, the Israeli military does have prominent female um, members. I mean, everyone serves male and female. And leadership specifically, do you see any difference in um, ability at just a general level? Well, yes, all leaders have various levels of ability. But that's what I mean, like on, on averages. So average male, average female, um, certainly there are strength discrepancies, but are there leadership propensities that differ? You know, I, I work with all kinds of male and female leaders and the good male leaders and the good female leaders all have the same fundamental characteristics and they follow the same principles and all the bad leaders that are male and female all have the same terrible idiosyncrasies and egos and emotional issues and so it's more based on the individual human being than it is based on what uh whether they're male or female mm. Uh, do you find that guys have a problem following a female superior? I'm sure some guys have a problem following a female superior. And I can also tell you factually that there are many, many guys that have a problem following male right. superiors. So if, some, if, if you're a guy with a big ego, you don't like listening to anybody. And you'll find whatever thing it is about them. Oh, freaking Tom is not, you know, he's he hasn't been to college or tom he hasn't done this job before or tom he doesn't even know what it's like to whatever i can find plenty of reasons that i shouldn't have to listen to you and if i can make it because you have uh brown hair or whatever or make it because you're a female it's all it's all just ego talking and it's it, you're gonna find that that person that doesn't want to be led by a female is gonna have whatever kind of beef with whatever kind of person is in that situation mm. If you were, would you have a problem following a female leader? No. Yeah. No. I mean, I've got, so, uh, well, three of the bigger companies that I have, um, Jocko Fuel, which is a supplement company, our, our COO is, is a female, Echelon Front, which is a leadership consulting company, our, our COO is a female. Mm. <laughs> so, and, and then Origin USA, which is a clothing manufacturing company, our COO is a female. So in fairness, though, you're the CEO of all those companies. So while for now, you clearly have high level leadership that are women, uh, if, if you and um, let's put it on the battlefield, if you had a um, high performing, very competent female leader, platoon leader. Sure. Uh, would you have any problem falling in line and following her the way that you would follow any male leader of similar competence. So hold on a second. You're asking me right now if there was a highly competent leader yep. that I had to work for, would I have any problem with it? Yes, if it was female. Like this is no factor. This it's it's no factor. Yeah. I I agree violently. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why anybody looks at anything other than competence. So if if a woman, if a anything can lead me to where I'm trying to get to, that is all I care about. I find it very weird that people don't use as their North Star utility, efficacy. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, is this gonna work or not? I mean, the discrepancy that you already mentioned, which is the discrepancy in combat, is the, is the physical component. Mm. That's the discrepancy in, in a combat situation, is uh, generally speaking, Females are smaller and weaker. And so in combat, that, depending on your job, that can be a significant issue. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your job isn't what you expect your job to be because sometimes your job is picking up your friend that weighs 200 pounds and then another 
200, another 70 pounds with gear on, and that's a problem. So, so for, for when you're talking about specifically in combat, there's a, there's a physical discrepancy that, that, that causes women to very seldomly have the physical capability to be in combat units. Mm. That's why they, they're not a ton of them in combat units. I mean, there's been some females have went, have gone through ranger school. Um, so I think there's been, yeah. So obviously there's females have gone through airborne school, but there's, there's, I think there's, there's an infantry Marine, uh, right now, female, mm. I, I believe, but I'm not hundred percent sure, yeah. but that's, that, that boils down, doesn't boil down to their, um, cognitive capacity or anything like that, or their leadership capability. It just boils down to their their biological uh, structure. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I partly asked just so that people can hear you, somebody obviously that they will really respect at this level, um, say the the North Star's competence. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I think is very, very wise. As we move forward as a country, there is a very big potential that we could face China as a, a either Cold War or flirting with a hot war if something kicks off in Taiwan, is that something that you think about? Uh, is, it, is it something that you think is plausible? Would you ever want to see American boots on the ground in Taiwan? Definitely not. I definitely wouldn't want to see that. But I don't think, it, I don't think the, I think the Chinese will wait. I think the Chinese will wait and let us, let us, um, let us go to war with ourselves first. And when we're going to war with ourselves, even not, not even a hot war in America, but just a, a cold war in America, a cold civil war, which is like sort of what we're in the beginning of right now. And, you know, it's funny now that I think about it, you know, I mentioned that, hey, these people aren't willing to sacrifice in a hot war, but we could definitely get into a cold civil war here where we can't progress, we can't make decisions. And if China can do, wait until we're at kind of the height of a, of a cold civil war, they could probably get away with anything. Hmm. And they know that. Yeah, China is patient. Uh, that is for sure. They think in much longer time cycles than we do. Um, yeah, it, it will be very interesting. Given how much technology comes out of Taiwan, it's so critical. It really will become a question, I think, of... Uh, if Xi ever feels like he's got time pressure on him and he needs to make a move, um, I don't, I'm not close enough to that whole thing and how Xi thinks, but um, certainly talking to enough high level people that there's some concern, even if it's not necessarily foot on the gas. My hope is that the Chinese economy has taken a big enough hit uh, right now that they're just not going to be in a position where now would be the time. Mm -hmm. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, I don't like kicking the can down the road for somebody else just to have to deal with it. I'd rather figure out a way around the problem. It certainly felt a lot better when we were a far more global society, uh, but the unwinding of that is very interesting. Speaking of that, in fact, uh, you manufacture in the US. So this is, is that in some ways a reaction to the gutting of American manufacturing as we globalized or what? It's 100%. It's 100% a reaction to that. Mm. We took our manufacturing and we sent it overseas and we are bringing it back to America. So it's 100% a reaction to that. And is that for, uh, we need a thriving middle class. What's the, what's the on the ground result you wanna achieve? Bring manufacturing back to America because that means you have a thriving minute. Uh, middle class. It means you have the ability to manufacture. It means you don't have to rely on, on people overseas to make things for you, which is almost where we were at. So there's a whole plethora of reasons. I mean, I grew, I grew up in New England. In New England, all the manufacturing jobs were sent overseas, especially in, in the clothing industry. They were sent overseas. They, and we have literally br bought machines from overseas and brought them back to America. So we are 100% bringing it back so that we as a nation can become self-sufficient again. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, if you care about, look, I mentioned freedom a little bit during this. 
if you care about freedom at all, and you're supporting companies that manufacture in overseas sweatshops where it's basically slave labor, that's a problem. And if you support environmental causes, well, when you manufacture stuff overseas, they don't care about the environment at all. They get done dying a pair of blue jeans and whatever's left over, they dump it in the river, which goes to the ocean, kills everything. They don't care. When they have to put something in the wash to, to, to break down some of the material, there's chemicals in that wash. What do they do with that when it's done? They dump it in the ocean. They don't care. They don't care at all. They don't care about their workers getting injured. They don't care about anything. And so if you care about freedom, if you care about the environment, if you care about the economy, if you care about America being self-sufficient, if you care about those things, your goal would be to, one of, your, one of the primary ways you could do that is to bring manufacturing back to this country. And that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, so self-reliance uh, is something I am getting as one of your drivers. I'm imagining you standing before the people that work at your company. They're, I have done this at my own company, so I know what this is like. And one of the things I was trying to do was paint what does it mean to work at the time quest, right? What does it mean to work there? What, what is the part of your identity that I want to breathe life into? What's the galvanizing identity, if you have one, that you try to give your workers? And I imagine that the sort of America, American spirit is part of that. Literally everything I just said and everybody that works for us knows and understands and believes in what we're doing and in what they're doing because they're what make it possible. You, you have to have people ready to work, and that's what we have. We have an incredible force of people that, are, that have these skills, that are learning these skills, and that are gonna take these skills and continue to grow with us. So they all, they all innately understand the importance of this, 100%. That's what we're doing. That's, that's why we're doing it, and that's, what we're doing, that's why we're doing it. And those people are the why. The, the people that, that, that work with us, they are the why. We are the why. It's America. They all know that. They all understand that. There's, this is, and, and it's actually been awesome to see because now I'm starting to see a lot more other companies are trying to bring manufacturing back. I'm supporting as much as I can, but everybody is starting to look around and say, oh yeah, we need to bring manufacturing back to America. And it's happening. It's, it's absolutely happening. And look, COVID helped out with that as well, right? Because all of a sudden you had the shipping problems, you had the customs problems, all that stuff made people realize how weak our supply chain was. And good companies looked around and said, that's, not a, that's too vulnerable of a position to be in. And it is too vulnerable of a position to be in, not only for a business, not only for an economy, but for a nation. You can't be reliant on other countries, especially adversarial countries, to, to allow you to buy goods from them. That's insanity. But our corporations, corporations in this country, they decided that profit was more important. They decided that if they could make a pair of blue jeans for $2 less and make $2 more and fire a bunch of American workers and shut down our supply chain, they decided it was worth it. And they did it and then they lied because they, li they lied to us and have said, we don't have the ability to do that anymore. That's a lie. That's a lie. This is America. This is America. We can make anything. And we will, and we're gonna show the world. That's dope, man. So as somebody who also manufactured here in America at the beginning of Quest, I can't speak to it now because I left, but um, when I was there, all of it in America, and it was awesome. Now, the crazy thing is, and I don't know if this is true for you as well, but we were manufacturing in Compton, City of Industry, like places where people came up hard, hard. And to be able to give people a legitimate business where they had opportunity to grow and to get health insurance and um, just be a part of something. And especially in the early days when nobody knew who we were. And it was just like, all right, we're here to do something. Like we're, cause we as a company had a mission that we were really trying to turn health around. 
and that we, so my wife and I uh, have said for a long time, it doesn't matter who you are today, it only matters who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. And so we were talking and I was like, do we really mean that or is that just some cool rhetoric? And we're like, no, we, we really do mean that. And I was like, okay, then if we mean that, we should be willing to consider somebody for employment even if they have a felony conviction. And she's like, yeah. So I was like, went to my partners. I'm like, what do you guys think? They're like, yeah, let's do it. So we decided to tell people, hey, even if you have felony conviction, we'll consider you for employment. We had people lined up around the building to interview. I had to interview people in groups. There were so many people coming in. We were growing so fast. And I remember telling them at one point, I started what I called Quest University. And I said, I will teach you anything you wanna know about entrepreneurship. And the reason I'm gonna, I'll come in early, I'll stay late, I'll teach you how to build a competitive nutrition company. And the reason I wanna do it is I really believe that if you understand that I care more about your future than your own mother, that you're probably gonna stay here. And if, you, if the more empowered you get, the more likely you are to leave, one, fine. Like if you can go off and do amazing things in this world, I'm here for it. But I have a feeling that I'm gonna be able to retain a ton of you just because you're like, yo, this really matters and this means something to me and thank you. And dude, it ended up being exactly that. Like seeing that moment where somebody thinks, um, cause I remember one kid came in and told me, cause I would give them like, guys, you have to understand, like you see an after picture of who I am now, you don't know who I used to be. And it's just a set of ideas, it always comes back to that for me, that took me from when I was broke and had no idea how to control my life to now running this billion dollar company. And I can teach you those ideas and it will have a similar impact on your life. And this one kid came to me and he's like, but I, you know, I, I just have a hard time believing in this because my mom told me that people look, that look like me, uh, the world doesn't want them to succeed. And I was like, homie, listen, you cannot think like that. And Kobe Bryant has this incredible quote, booze don't block dunks. And I was like, you can get so good at something that even if people want you to fail, they can't stop you. And so the goal is just to get that good, get so good that nobody can stop you from doing this thing. And so just so many of these guys went on to change their lives and do incredible things. And obviously Quest ends up becoming this historic uh, run. And partly because we just had so many people there bleeding to make it happen. It, it really was extraordinary. So from the outside, hopefully people wanna bring manufacturing back to America. But when you're in the middle of it, it is intoxicating of like, the sense of pride and creating something and being a part of something, it's, it's really pretty incredible. I see the exact same thing on all fronts. I mean, Echelon Front, our consulting company, we've got people traveling around the country and the world, teaching people these leadership principles that's gonna make their life and their business so much better. Mm -hmm. the, the supplement company, Jocko Fuel, the, the extent that we went through to make the cleanest possible product was extraordinary. And everybody on the team knows that the standard is so high, it's unmatched. Um, the, the, the energy drink here, like this is just to give you an indication, I didn't wanna have chemical preservatives in it. And so the only way to overcome that was to pasteurize, pasteurize the drink, yeah. which means heat it up. And there was no lines that had pasteurization tunnels to make the drink in America. At so, all? At all. Whoa. So we pushed back our timeline almost a year Ooh, and had God. a line built that had the pasteurization wow. in it so we could put the cleanest product out there that, and my standard is, like the, the anecdotal standard for me is I want my kids to have this. So my own kids, I want them to be drinking this. It, it, I don't want to make, I'm not going to make anything that I wouldn't be happy that my kids are drinking or consuming, and that's the standard, so everybody knows it there. And then yeah, at Origin USA, say, same thing. Everybody knows, and they know they've got an opportunity, especially, you know, you go up into, well, we got factories in North Carolina, we got factories in Maine. Those are areas that were decimated, decimated. And now, I mean, no jobs. And now, we've got people that were from that industry are now coming back and they're taking that knowledge and passing it on to the next generation. And it's just phenomenal. And yeah, the, the, the feeling that you get, and we, we do the same thing. Like, hey, we, we invest as much as we can into our people. Mm -hmm. And sure, they can look around and go, hey, I think I could do, go do this myself. 
okay, I'll invest. If you, you want to go try this, go. But most, actually, almost every one of them says, no, we want it. We're, we're in. We're on, the, we're on the train. Let's go. So it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing opportunity and a blessing to be able to have this opportunity. But I think that this mentality is, is, is spreading because people recognize, again, due to COVID, due to what's going on in the country. I mean, one of the, that's one of the problems that we have. Why are people sitting around looking at social media? Because they, they don't have a career that they are invested in. Mm -hmm. They don't have a skill set. Well, if you come and you learn how to work a loom and you learn how to weave material, all of a sudden you've got a, a job and a skill and value, and that's awesome. So I, I think these things, they're going to have impact and they're going to continue to have impact, not just, you know, from an economic perspective, but really from a cultural perspective inside the country. So speaking to that, meaning and purpose, finding that at work, one thing I've heard you say that um, we're looking at the same data and we're seeing something very different is you say, ah, I hear all the time that young men are really struggling. There's something unique going on. There's nothing unique going on. This has always been an, an age that people go through, whether you're back in the 40s, mm -hmm. 80s, whatever. It doesn't matter. You're always going to see it. Um, I look at the data, and the data seem to suggest that there really is uh, something unusual happening. I wrote a bunch of the statistics down. Um, so... Uh, according to uh, Mission Readiness, 75% um, of 17 to 24 year olds uh, back in 2009 were ineligible for military service due to lack of education, obesity, and other physical problems. That number's declined to 71%, but hasn't exactly uh, gone to a great number. The former Undersecretary of the Army, Joe Reeder, said, imagine 10 young people walking into a recruiter's office and seven of them getting turned away. We cannot allow today's dropout crisis to become a national security crisis. Men are physically weaker than they were 30 years ago. Grip strength is down 26 pounds for men aged 25 to 29. Obesity rates uh, for young men have skyrocketed, for young people have skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Fewer young men are having sex. That one's a big trigger for me. Uh, more men are committing suicide, which obviously is terrifying. Anxiety and depression rates are off the charts. Uh, and the military in general just has a recruiting problem largely for the thing that I said above, but also there's just a negative sentiment against the military. Um, but you look at that and you think same as it ever was. Well, you know, according to your numbers, it's not same as it ever was. So if you think you're a person that's listening to this right now and you might be on that list for one reason or another, I got some ideas for you. Go to the gym, start training jujitsu, clean up what you're eating, try and figure out a skill that you want to learn. Go learn that skill. Go be productive. Go make money. Go meet some girls, apparently, if you've got some issues where you're not having sex. So I think these are all things that you can you can remedy. I mean, they're clearly things that you can remedy. And as far as the military goes, what they probably need to do is some kind of a program where we take people that aren't physically ready for the military and put them through a program for four weeks, and you could probably get just about anyone ready for the military in four weeks of training, mm -hmm. maybe six weeks. So, yeah, that's uh, it's sad to hear those things. You know, it's probably the reason that I don't see a lot of it is because, well, I own a gym in San Diego, California, called Victory MMA. I own a gym, and guess what? The gym's filled with a bunch of people that are trying to get better, a bunch of men and women and girls and boys that are in there training, learning jiu-jitsu, lifting weights, doing pull-ups. Like, it's, that's what I see. And it's, and it's a lot of them. And then, obviously, with the supplement company, you see people all the time. We sell a lot of product. Why are we doing that? Well, because people want to get better. They want to eat healthier. They want to be, they want to have clean fuel in their system. So that indicates to me that people are, shifting in the right direction and echelon front we do events all over the country oftentimes when we do those events the questions that we get asked are about being being physically in shape how to manage your health how to stay on the right path so even though there's some anecdotal information and it's not even anecdotal even though you've got some facts there that paint a pretty sad picture i would go so far as to say we might be at some kind of a bottom of the trough right now and people have recognized that that's where we're at. And now people have turned the corner and recognized that we got to get back into shape, get off of your phones, get out into the gym, 
get into the field, get outside, go walk, go hike, go run, go train jujitsu, and go get after it. And I think that is, again, I would venture to say that we are probably at the bottom of a trough right now, and we're climbing out of it, and we're about to rebound and end up higher on the other side. How's that for some positivity coming at you? I like it. That was good. And it was <laughs> That's what I see. As That's well. what I see all the time. That's what I see. Mm. I see these people. I, I I have a gym. I go to. I see these people every single day, and there's new people signing up every single day. We sell supplements that make you stronger and healthier, and people buy them all the time. That's a huge indicator of where people's minds are. I think COVID helped because I think during COVID, people started doing research. People started to recognize how important it was to be healthy. So I think there's some things that are gonna swing, swing us out of this trough and we're gonna be stronger, faster, and smarter than we ever were in this country. I love it. I'll sign up for that message. Uh, when people ask me, hey, I wanna get into business, what should I do? The first thing I will tell them very often is get in the gym and get in shape. Why do you want to see people uh, get control of their body? That's using my language. But why do you want to see them get in the gym? Because everything else in your life will get better. Everything. Everything else in your life will get better. Why everything you, else in your life. Why will do get you better. think that happens? You know, take take your car to the shop and get it tuned up. It's it's going to do better. It's going to do everything better. It's going to accelerate better. It's going to brake better. The radio is going to sound clear. Everything is going to be better. It's going to right smell Jocko, better. Why do I need my body to be in shape? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it will help everything that you do if you start to exercise. And I recommend, look, exercise whenever you can. You got to make it work. I recommend you exercise in the morning. I recommend you get up, you get out of bed, you go exercise, get on a program. It doesn't matter what the program is. And if, you're, if you haven't worked out in 20 years and you're totally out of shape, cool. Start by, start by walking. Start by doing a 10-minute walk. 15 minute walk, then a 20 minute walk, then a five minute jog, and then a 10 minute jog, and then get yourself a pull-up bar and start hanging on that thing. And then start doing a couple push-ups. like just start to build. And you, every part of your life's gonna get better. It's, it's not just, oh, this knucklehead Jocko sitting here saying your life's gonna get better. No, you will be healthier. You will be more Cognitively, cognitively aware of what's going on. Like your brain is sharper when you're exercise. You're, you will sleep better. You will think more clearly. Everything's going to be better. You'll perform better at your job, no matter what that job is. So yeah, go get after it. Yeah, I, I really agree. This is one of those. Um, I think the best thing I ever did for getting good at business was get control of my body. Uh, one, to get control of your body, you first have to get control of your mind. That helps. And then there's also this really fascinating thing that happens that when you realize I showed up every day consistently, I pushed myself to failure, I did things that were hard, that were I was very awkward in the beginning, and my body changed. I was able to, you know, um, bend over and pick up a weight that when I first came into the gym, I could not do. It's really hard to track when you're getting mentally more capable. It's very easy to see that you're getting physically more capable. And so and those two things correlate for sure. They correlate. So when you become more physically capable, you will become more mentally capable. When you become physically more resilient, you'll become mentally more resilient. Mm. That, that is a, that is what will happen. That is what will happen. For sure. Um, talk to me about fear and compartmentalizing that. So this idea of get after it. I love that. Again, another thing I think people are intoxicated by with your personality is, um, as you've said this many times, but people look at buds and, and it is this mental thing of, could I do it, right? The number of times I've asked myself whether, would I make it? Uh, I think 15% or something make it. Um, so that's, part of this, um, but also just you've been in a situation where bullets are flying at your head and you've had to be calm and detach and step back and tell people where to go and face that I could make a call that gets somebody killed, um, that you're not playing a game, that on the other end of your gun is a, a human whose life you are actively trying to take and victory is killing them. It's surreal. It's something that, that operators touch a lot, but the rest of us, man, that, that is like the most 
unfathomable, I can't believe this actually happens to people kind of thing. And so the fact that you can control your mind in that situation is unbelievable. How, how do you control your mind? Is it just exposure? How, how do you get? Yeah, there's certainly some exposure therapy behind it. And, and that's one thing I learned once I, once I was towards the end of my career in the SEAL teams and I was teaching and I was instructing and I was running the advanced SEAL training, what I got to see was I got to see, I got to watch how I could put somebody that doesn't have much experience into a pressure situation and I could watch them fall apart. And then I could talk to them, we could rehearse some things and you put them in another pr pressure situation and they'd be a little bit better. And then you do it again, they're a little bit better. And usually there would be a moment of sort of a profound moment where, I don't know, what's a good, uh, it's almost like riding a bike. You know how you can't ride a bike and then you can? Mm. That's, that's what I feel happens with the ability to detach and take a step back. It's like you can't ride a bike and then you can, or you, you, you can't, you never stood up on a surfboard and then you did. It's like that kind of thing. So I'd see guys get a little bit better, and then all of a sudden there'd be a switch that would go, and they'd be able to take take a step back, detach, they'd be calm. And how do we do that? We put them in those pressure situations repetitively, talk them through. Sometimes I'd have to be like, there's mayhem going on. It's a training scenario, but there's mayhem going on. There's paintball flying everywhere. There's explosions going off, and I'm looking at you, and you're the leader, and you got a look on your face. You're totally overwhelmed. And sometimes I would literally say, hey, Tom, come here. And I'd, I'd take you, I'd pull you into the, into the corner of a building where there's no paintball's gonna hit you. And I go, take a breath. <laughs> Dude, take a breath. All right, look around. Take a look around. All right, what's your next move gonna be? And just by doing that, you'd realize, oh my gosh, 25 seconds ago, I was totally focused on that one window over there where I think we're taking fire from. And I had this guy yelling over here and I didn't know what to do with him. And I, I, I got, someone was calling me on the radio and I didn't know what that was about. I took a step. I got myself into a spot where I could look around. I took a breath and now I can see, yep, we need to flank the guy in that window. The wounded guy's yelling a lot, but he's gonna be okay. And I need to get my forces consolidated on this building. And it would be that clear. So, Sometimes I would have to kind of hold someone's hand as they're detaching or I'd have to pull them out of the scenario a little bit so they would de facto be detached from it. Sometimes we take it, if you were having a real hard time as a leader, I'd be like, all right, Tom, you, you're coming with me as from the instructor viewpoint. And now you're not in the firefight anymore. Now you're looking around like, why don't they just go over there? You and I would literally be standing one foot away from the leader that's supposed to be making the call. And you'd say to me, hey, why, does, why don't they just go over there? And I'd say, well, it's, it's easy to see right now, isn't it? Goes, yeah, it's so, so obvious. Why is that? Because your, your, your subordinate leader that's right there, right next to us, can't see this most obvious thing. Why? Because he's all emotional. He's all caught up in the scenario. He's panicking. And you, since you're not in the scenario, you're one foot away and you can easily see the solution. And so can I. So what you need to do, Tom, is you need to learn that when you're in that mayhem, you need to learn to detach, take a step back and look around. Take a breath and then make a call. That's what you're gonna do. And that would help guys to have that eureka moment where they went from being a panicked, emotional, overwhelmed human to being a calm, detached, squared away leader. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. And um, that's something I wanna train more in myself. Uh, I think it's something that either I am, I have just a mild natural advantage or uh, just maybe business has put me in that situation so many times, but I'm very sad that the following is a true story. Um, a couple of years ago, Christmas Eve, man, of all times, we were having a party and uh, the guy that we were gonna play poker and pay a professional dealer, he mm -hmm. comes in, he brings a table, all that, set up the table. I go in the kitchen to get a drink and my wife comes running in. She's like, you have to hurry, uh, the dealer's having a heart attack. And I come running into the room and the only thing is to do nothing or deal with it. There, there's no, 
gunfire or anything. It's just this one person is now in a very bad situation. And it was fascinating to see the different reactions in the room. There were some people that just moved away. The fact that they came to get me instead of dealing with the situation was already like, okay, that's interesting. So I go into the room and you just go into, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer, solutions ultimately are all that matter. So it's just like, okay, one, we need to assess what's going on. Cause I looked at him, I'm like, he's not having a heart attack. I'm like, he's having a stroke. And so stop, identify, and then you start telling people what to do. You call 911 and come back. I remember being trained on that. Mm -hmm. Call 911 and come back. I don't know why that always stuck with me. Uh, and then it was, you know, the person on the call is like, hey, you need to start doing chest compressions. And, and you just do the thing. But it was, I really had this strong impulse in me. I don't want to be dealing with this. And so I had to like step past that. And I needed to have thought a million times before that moment, just always look for the solution. What's the solution? Move towards it. So obviously you have to first know your goal to know what the solution is. Save this guy's life. Okay, cool. Save his life. What now are the solutions in order to do that? But it was interesting to me that there's still this tremendous amount of friction. From the moment that my wife came in and said he's having a heart attack, I wasn't like, hoorah, I'm not that guy, right? I wasn't like, oh my God, this is great. I get approved. What? You're just like, I hold myself accountable in this moment to overcoming this friction, becoming solution oriented and doing the thing. But I was like, if people don't sort of pre-rehearse, have a plan, train for whatever life is gonna throw at you, if they feel the same amount of friction I feel to not wanting to be in a situation where somebody is having a stroke, it's fucking terrifying. Uh, they're gonna back off. And so you could just see that happen in the room where there was a, a small number of us that had obviously mentally rehearsed these kind of moments and so we handled it and then there were people for whom their rehearsal was, I know who to get if anything ever kicks off and so they acted accordingly. It's very, very interesting. And so um, how do, like for the average person that's never gonna be in combat, what are the things that they can do to answer questions like, will I show up in that moment? Would I do myself proud? And they're never gonna know if they'll do themselves proud in buds, but will I be able to do myself proud in moments where they get hard? Like um, Mark Devine does something, Coco Row or, I don't know. Do you know Mark Devine? I, I know who he is. Navy SEAL uh, runs a sort of um, buds for the average person who just wants to see if they can make it and it's done over three days or whatever. Um, what can we do to better prepare ourselves to know who we will be in moments of difficulty? Do hard things, whether that's, uh, you know, waking up every day and working out, whether that's going to jujitsu class, whether that's going to some kind of environment where there's going to be a stress that you're not used to. What, what, what kind of thing makes you afraid? Oh, heights makes you afraid. Cool. Let's learn how to parachute. Oh, public speaking makes you afraid. Cool. Let's go do some public speaking going out of your comfort zone and overcoming the butterflies that are going to be in your stomach and the little mini panic attacks that you're going to have, go do those things and do them as often as you possibly can. And you will get used to all these little feelings that, that, that arise when some pressure situation unfolds. And it's funny. You said that you, you had like a friction of when you're what, or they came in and said, Hey, something's wrong. Mm. And you went into the mode of like, okay, well, we're gonna go solve the problem. You, that's what you're used to doing. You know, you were the CEO of a company. How many times did it say, the manufacturing, there's, we got a call from the customer, the, the shipping didn't happen. You, you dealt with a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And no, they weren't like someone's life was at stake, like it wasn't this particular moment, but the process that you go through, we've got a bad situation. Okay, I can run away from it. That's not gonna help. I can complain about it, that's not gonna help. Mm. I can panic, that's not gonna help. I can find a solution, that's gonna help. That's what I'm gonna go do. And so you go out and you do things that are challenging and you will build some muscle memory of what to do in pressure situations so you don't panic, you don't do dumb things. And there's companies out there, uh, you know, Tim Kennedy's got a company called Sheepdog Response and they do this kind of training. My friend Mike Glover has a company called Fieldcraft Survival and they, travel around the country doing events where you're gonna put get put in pressure situations. We have an event at Echelon Front. 
which is, we call it the FTS, it's a field training exercise. So we, we, it's very leadership focused, but it also provides some panic scenarios because we're gonna put you into simulated combat situations. We have a really high speed, it's basically a laser tag system, but it's a really high speed laser tag system. But we have role players, we have explosions going off, smoke filled air, mayhem going on, missions to go accomplish, and we get to see people panic, people freak out. We also get to see the switch turn where they go, oh yeah, I know I can't panic. I know I can't freak out. I know what I need to do is lead, step up, make decisions. This is how I do it. This is my protocol. Take a step back, take a breath, look around, make a call. We teach people how to do that. That's what we do. So the from a leadership perspective and from an individual perspective, that's why we created a program like that. Field training exercise, echelon front. Boom, you go in there, you learn some basic tactics, but it's not a tactical course. It's a course to learn how to handle stress and how to lead in stressful dynamic environments. And when we get done with that, when, we, when someone gets done with that course where they're, they got a hostage to rescue, there's explosions going off, they got, they're missing people out on the battlefield, there's down men, they're screaming, there's yelling, they go back to work on Monday morning and it's like, okay, something's wrong with the supply chain. All right, talk, to me, talk me through the problem, let's get a solution. It puts everything in perspective. And most important, they learn a protocol of how to deal with stress and how to detach from that stress and how to lead in those stressful environments. Jocko, may we never need you as a warlord, but good Lord, I am so glad that you spend so much time talking to people and running companies and doing all this. It's really incredible. Where can people follow along on your incredible journey? Jocko.com. That's, that's real simple. And then, yeah, I'm on, I'm on all the, the social media at Jocko Willink. So Instagram, Twitter X, I call it Twitter X now, uh, Twitter X, Facebook. I'm on all those things. Uh, don't spend too much time on them. You want to come on there and check it out, then check it out, but don't get sucked into those algorithms. They're trying to, they're trying to polarize you and send you flying in some extreme direction. Don't let it happen. That they are. So yeah. And then jockofuel.com. Origin USA. So I didn't. I don't know if I mentioned the, the name mm -hmm. of the company, manufacturing stuff in America. It's OriginUSA.com. You can get jujitsu geese, jeans, boots, t-shirts, hoodies, all made 100% in America. Hunt gear, all made 100% in America. So, yeah, OriginUSA.com. And then Echelon Front. I just talked about Echelon Front. EchelonFront.com. That's where we do leadership consulting, leadership training, and outstanding company. I love it. Right on, man. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. If you like this conversation, check out this episode to learn more. Where World War III looks different than World War II is that World War III is being fought through these proxy wars, third country battles, oftentimes poor or impoverished battles.